from countries as far away as Sweden and Slovakia, some of the world's best swordsmen and martial artists have come to Massachusetts this fall to test their skills in one of the newest and fastest growing family of martial arts today. Over the past two days, 50 fighters have had their martial skills tested intensely across multiple combat forms, including wrestling, dagger fighting, sword play, and spear work. These weaponized, constructed from the historical records of ancient martial masters across the Western Hemisphere, are just a sample of the rapidly growing breadth and depth of the historical European martial arts, known also as HEMA. As we prepare for this live broadcast of the finals, only a fraction of these talented fighters remain, ready to put their reputations on the line and their skills to the test one last time. Forte Productions proudly presents the 2013 Iron Gate Exhibition. All right, and welcome to Danvers Indoor Sports, uh, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, this fall, 2013. Uh, I am uh, Jeff Tsai, the host of Iron Gate Exhibition. Uh, and uh, also director of Forte Productions, bringing this live stream to you. And with me, we also have Scott Brown, uh, our, one of our technical uh, commentators for today. Uh, and uh, we apologize for the delays, but uh, our technical team has been uh, <coughs> working pretty hard to get things all set up. So, uh, so at this point, I think we're looking pretty good, uh, and we're going to get started pretty quick uh, in terms of moving forward with the different uh, competitions. So um, to give people sort of an overview, we've got a number of competitions coming up. Uh, uh, one of the things about the event this year is the, the fact that we did quite a different series, uh, a, a, a long series of different uh, skills challenges across different weapon forms. Uh, and uh, we'll go into those different things as we go um, in the live stream here. But uh, one of the, the things we'll be starting with is actually a cutting tournament. As you can see, um, you know, one of the screens we'll show you soon uh, are some of the cutting mats uh, that are set up uh, in preparation uh, for the cutting. So um, you'll see cutting, some cutting mats coming up pretty soon uh, that are uh, set up in, in particular arrangement for uh, the finals of our cutting. Um, and uh, for our finalists, we actually will have four people that uh, will be uh, demonstrating their cutting skills. Um, in, uh, let's see, I believe in fourth place currently we have uh, Tristan Zakowski, uh, New York Historical Fencing Association, uh, James Clark uh, from Nova Salto uh, in third, uh, in second we have Ben Hawkins uh, from Academy of Historical Arts, and first we, we have uh, Andrew Kilgore uh, from uh, Athena, uh, located here in Boston. So Scott, uh, do you have any comments about any of these fighters? Well, uh, most of these guys are pretty expected. They've both been, around, uh, most of them, been around the cutting circuit, uh, the Tatana cutting circuit, for a while now. Uh, the one exception to that probably is James Clark from Nova Salto, uh, working down there with um, Stephen Reich and those guys. Um, Andrew Kilgore is a little bit of a surprise. He did well in this tournament, I believe, last year. Yep. That's or perhaps right. I'm thinking of another. Event. No, so you're uh, correct. Yeah. And, yep. But he. You know, he's a very athletic and talented guy, and he's done sort of remarkably well. In fact, we're going to see Andrew throughout the day, That's right. uh, throughout the afternoon here, uh, in, I think, three or possibly four events. Four yes, events. It's, it's hard to keep track at this point. He's got a lot of talent <laughs> that got spread around a lot of different uh, tournaments here. So he'll be back. He will certainly be back after the, after the cutting, regardless of what happens. So um, before we uh, get started with the cutting, uh, we're actually going to start with uh, a bit of an interview with uh, one of our other locals, uh, Michael Chidester, uh, known to folks uh, as the, the head uh, behind uh, Wichtenauer, um, one of the uh, online portals to all sorts of good historical uh, uh, documentation and, and uh, uh, treatises. So Mike, welcome. Welcome to, the, uh, uh, to, to Iron Gate. Thank so, you. you're welcome. Um, so, uh, one of the reasons I'm bringing you up here is because, um, you know, obviously you're known for your work with uh, Wittenauer, uh, uh, and in terms of the, the scholarly side,
side of the event, which is something that we, we try to maintain uh, as an important part of the event. Um, you know, this event, in terms of a local event, uh, you know, encompasses you know many different groups, including the Higgins, actually, and we're going to be talking about more of them, uh, more about the Higgins over the course of uh, the event here. But um, you know, do you have any any thoughts about? Um, uh, the sort of the, the role of, of how what the, the Higgins plays and, and scholarship plays with, with, with regards to all of you know, what we practice. <laughs> well, thanks for the broad question. Yeah, you're uh, welcome. Obviously, lots of leeway. Without the manuals, there's not HEMA, and opinions differ on that. But that's my line, and I'm sticking to it. That the, what makes HEMA different from anything else is the fact that we're entirely dependent on on manuals on or treatises, I should say for everything that we do and we look them for support we look for them for inspiration we look to them for all the techniques that we try to bring out in our fencing so I think if the treatises didn't exist there would not be HEMA today right. so, and right. that's, that's a basic fact that I don't think you can argue we as we get into the more developed as we get more developed in the systems that we're studying especially with longsword we see this a lot there is a sort of tendency to focus more on the sport, on the fencing, yeah. on the actual competition aspect of it. So it's really important to stay connected to the manuals and stay focused on the fact that without our attachment to the treatises, without our attachment right. to the historical masters, right. we really are just sport fencing. Right, so, exactly. So a balance well, between the <coughs> practice and the, uh, the theory, right? Exactly. Understood. Yep. So actually, the one thing I wanted you also to tie into, uh, this is actually a four-day event this year, and the reason for the fourth day is because uh, we're actually being hosted by the Higgins on Monday, uh, and I believe you will be one of the speakers there. So you I want to talk yes. a little bit about the program that uh, we have envisioned for that day? So on Monday, we're going to be talking about historical swordsmanship and especially the context of historical swordsmanship and how it fit into history and how and its relationship to the art, obviously, that we're practicing. Right, right. And that's going to be combining lectures and a Q&A. We have Jean-Marie Chandler and Jeff Lord, right. who have both have done a lot of good HEMA research, and myself will also be, I will be lecturing as well. And we're also going to have a museum tour mm -hmm. of the Higgins Armory, which I believe is the largest collection of arms and armor, or the largest arms and armor museum dedicated to that in the Western Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And it's closing at the end of the year, unfortunately, so this is our last chance to really get an inside look at it. Dr. Jeffrey Forgang will be taking us through the collection, and we'll be able to look at a lot of the artifacts before they move to their new home. And in addition to that, jean Rich Chandler will be giving us a lot of information about the historical context right. of these arts. And Jeff Lord and I are giving a more focused presentation, talking particularly about Joachim Meyer and his art, and trying to give some context and some understanding of that. Very good, very good. So um, hopefully we'll come back to that uh, towards the end of the program, talking about the Higgins. Uh, but for now, uh, I think what we're going to do is uh, start getting things kicked off. Uh, so um, we're going to talk very soon about the cutting. So first up in our series of tournaments, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, what we consider in this tournament the category of weapon skills. Um, so we're going to be talking about weapon skills, and we're going to turn this over to our uh, cutting maestro, uh, Stephen Hirsch. Hello everybody and welcome to the 2013 Iron Gate Exhibition Cutting Tournament. My name is Steven Hirsch and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this cutting tournament before we get into the rules and the actual competition. So one of the things uh, that we have to deal with in HEMA is the fact that no single activity of ours uh, perfectly recreates what a real fight would be like. When we fight with blunt swords, things happen differently because they are blunt than they would if they were sharp. Tournaments aren't perfect recreations of fights <laughs> in other ways as well. So one of the ways we seek to overcome this is by including tournaments like this, which address the skill of cutting. The targets being used for this tournament are tatami. This is because tatami provides us with a reliable, repeatable, and valid test. It's not a simulation of anything in particular, 
and one should not view the cutting tournament in general as a simulation of anything in particular. We are taking a particular skill set and we are testing it in a safe and a reliable way. We have cutting tournaments uh, in large part because of the works of Michael Edelson uh, over the past couple of years in encouraging cutting tournaments in HEMA. He ran the first one last year. Uh, I took that ball and ran with it and we've been sort of passing back and forth in terms of uh, innovating and developing rules. Scott Brown ran a workshop on cutting and weapon skills at Factual America this year and I have sought to incorporate ideas from that uh, that set of suggestions as well in today's tournament. Um, and those were featured in some of the things that happened earlier, which will show up on the highlights reel. So what's going to happen here is that the competitors are going to be in the situation where they've got three targets. They have this sword, the Albion Baron. They will approach one target make a pair of cuts, approach the next target, make the same pair of cuts, approach the third target, and another pair of cuts. And they will continue around until they've completed each of the mats. There's a specific pattern that the competitors are required to follow for these uh, cuts. For the first two mats that are just a Tommy, the uh, competitors will have to perform special cuts. Special cuts is a broad category and is intentionally broad in an attempt to make sure that different traditions are able to compete on a level playing field here. So any cut with the back or short or false edge of the sword is a special cut, as is a crooked cut with hands crossed and a slinging cut with a single hand. So the first pattern is going to be special cut one and then a different special cut. Special cut one and a different special cut. It's simply two descending cuts against this linen covered target. The linen covered target is substantially more difficult to cut through because of the protective qualities of the textile. The pattern then continues with special cut number one again, and then a horizontal cut. Special cut number one, and then a horizontal cut, and then a pair of rising cuts. They come back to this mat, and we'll have to do rising cuts again, alternating left and right, rising cuts, alternating left and right, and then horizontal cuts, alternating left and right. And they will continue those last elements of rising cuts on the two tatami mats and horizontal cuts on the linen covered mats until they are done with each of their given stamps. When the competitor is done with their mats, they will step back behind this line and then we will stop time. The score overall for the tournament is based on several factors. One is successful cuts. Another is the amount of time that it took for you to uh, complete those cuts. And the third is the ratio of uh, attempted cuts to successful cuts. So if you throw a lot of cuts, but only succeed in half of them, your score will be much more poor, even if you completed all the cuts that you were supposed to uh, effectively. If you threw twice as many cuts, they wouldn't do as well. Whereas if each and every single cut is perfect, then you will have a much larger score as a result. With that, we're going to go ahead and move into the finals. Our first competitor is going to be Andrew Kilgore. Yeah, So the scores are cumulative over the course of the entire tournament. The scores as they stand entering the final round are Andrew Kilgore, 10.86, Ben Hawkins, 7.51, James Clark, 6.77, Tristan Zukowski, 6.73. Andrew, are you ready? Go ahead and take the sword. Ready. 
Beginning, there was a bit of a rocky start. A bit of a rocky start, but uh, uh, still, uh, still actually did a pretty good job of uh, finishing through this crash. Uh, well, yeah, I agree. It started off a little rocky. I was particularly impressed by him putting the parent piece into the trip uh, in the middle of the trip. <laughs> well, um, but actually, he did, there. he did very good by when he turned to the linen covered targets. Um, those are a lot more difficult yeah. for a lot of people and uh, he kind of seemed to get his flow back once he turned to that target. Right. Um, he seemed to use up a lot of mat so when he wanted to get more cuts in towards the end he right. really had to struggle on lower lines. Um, but you know that's the name of the game, you got to manage that, that material uh, along the way. I'll right. uh, be interested to see how the other guys you know, perform in, in, context, right. in contrast yeah. to that. Yeah. I think that's a pretty it's a pretty, pretty reasonable bar to set, uh, and uh, I, but I think there's also a lot of room for improvement uh, by the other uh, competitors. Well, sure, he's out in the lead, and I think that you know that sort of rocky start will give these other guys an opportunity yep, to, exactly. to kind of step forward and take the first place. But we'll see, we'll see. Yeah, there's still room. I think who do we have up next? Uh, so actually, you know, along the vein of uh, local uh, local supporters, Hickory Arms, uh, one of our local vendors, uh, specializing uh, unsurprisingly in wooden. Uh, wooden weapons, wooden wasters. Um, uh, they've been uh, around uh, New England for quite some time. It's, I believe it's changed hands in terms of the ownership, uh, but uh, still producing pretty good stuff uh, in terms of wooden wasters. So they, they were actually here, uh, they are here over the course of the weekend as a local vendor. So one of the two vendors uh, on site. Uh, the other, we will talk about further, uh, Purple Heart Armories, um, uh, who is doing quite a uh, bit of supporting uh, for the event as well. Uh, and uh, you know, plenty more coming from them uh, in, a, in a little bit. So, all right. So as as we're going here, um, Stephen and his crew are telling things up, uh, and uh, I'm not sure if they're going to announce results at all. But uh, uh, just doing a little bit of administrivia here to uh, to figure out what needs to be done for the second uh, the second cutter coming up. Uh, who will be Ben Hawkins. Um, so, uh, Higgins Armory Museum, as we mentioned, also local, uh, and obviously a supporter of the event since they are uh, hosting us for our fourth day. Fantastic facility. Yes, they will, they will certainly be missed. All right, here we go. Ooh. Oh. A one-handed cut, nice. Oh, showing off again. All right, someone's raising the bar here. <laughs> nice middle. Wow, this is going to be uh, this is going to be tough to beat. <laughs> done. <laughs> Nicely done by Ben Hoffman. And uh, I believe that's how you cut like a boss. And sponsored again. Uh, by the way, I should mention that we have a ton of, uh, of uh, sponsors uh, to talk about today. Um, M-Blades, yet another one, uh, one of uh, our folks, our friends from uh, Europe, uh, providing, how would you describe the, the other products that they provide, Scott? Well, they're engineers, so a lot of their, you know, the, the equipment that they're bringing um, are you know, coming from that engineering background. 
Uh, right now his most popular item is the swing, of course, and there's a couple of variations on that with uh, adjustable parts, pommels and crosses and so on. Uh, great for traveling or working indoors uh, if it's middle of winter and you don't have high ceilings, that sort of thing. Um, but he's also uh, you know, put together and he won an award um, uh, at a university for a collapsible sword that had uh, soft edges that still behaved uh, similar to a steel sword. Mm -hmm. So a very intelligent guy. He's also the guy um, uh, working on the prototypes for a new glove that uh, the entire community is very excited about. So yeah. hopefully we'll see a lot more exciting things from M-Blades in the future because they've been doing great stuff so far. Absolutely. And uh, speaking of other uh, equipment vendors, um, two that we will have to talk about uh, uh, are, are very important here for our event, uh, one of which is Albion Swords. Um, uh, one of the two uh, vendors providing uh, actual sharp blades uh, as prizes um, for the event. Um, and as you, as you can imagine, sharp swords are not, uh, they're not cheap. Uh, they are, they're quite expensive uh, and uh, quite valuable to the community at the moment. So uh, the fact that they are providing uh, uh, not just one, but actually two uh, sharps between the two of them, um, Albion providing one, uh, it, it's very impressive. It, I mean, the, the, the amount, the dollar amount of, of prizes at this event is kind of staggering, actually. So the other uh, vendor providing a, a sharp uh, is uh, Arms and Armor, uh, also another very well-known vendor here in the States. Uh, both of these guys, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's becoming a little bit of a duel off in terms of uh, what they're able to contribute, what, what they're willing to contribute, and uh, I really can't, um, I really can't, uh, recommend either of these guys uh, enough. I mean, big thank you to, to both of them. Scott, do you, uh, do you have any experience with these guys? I have a lot of experience with both of these companies. Um, <clears throat> you know, first of all, I love that they're U.S. made. You mm -hmm. know, a little Absolutely. proud for the home team. That's right. Um, but the reality is, is both companies have been servicing the, the HEMA communities, um, both here in the U.S. and abroad, for, you know, 15 years more. It, specifically the communities themselves and they've been in business for a lot longer than that as well um, you can always call Craig over at Arms and Armor and get a great uh, custom sword or you know, tweaks on the, their existing swords uh, great customer service uh, real especially fine detail uh, attention to detail and you have a similar product over at Albion you know they make great uh, training swords uh, and they're always ready to go you know you can get them you know delivered within a week or two that's not a bad deal. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, both of them make both training swords, rebated swords, as well as sharp swords. Uh, and so what it, what it provides for the HEMA communities is a pretty wide range of, of, of tools and toys to play with. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, in a moment, we're actually going to be doing an interview um, uh, uh, with uh, uh, some of the competitors here. Um. All right, so it looks like they're having a technical difficulty with one of the stands, so why don't we jump o over to uh, Natasha. You want to interview Natasha for a moment? Uh, actually, I believe you know Natasha pretty well, right? So I think maybe you can ask the hard questions that I just wouldn't know to ask. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> actually, good. Oh, actually, so we can go. We can go. Off there. That's good. I'll get all the juicy stuff sitting right oh, here. Dear. So, Natasha. <laughs> Welcome, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Everybody knows you. And so, you're going to be servicing us later in the context of being the uh, maestro of ceremonies, and we appreciate that. Thank you. But Purple Heart's been a longtime supporter of the HEMA communities. Um, obviously, another U.S. company, which we're all proud of. But um, why do you continue to do it? What a great question. <laughs> Why? Well, Why do you um, put up with us? I know. <laughs> Simply, um, it's, it's my full-time job. Um, I am able to work at home. I'm able to stay home with my kids if I need to. Um, now that my kids are older, I'm able to travel and actually go to events and support the community in person. Um, it's, it's just a, it's a job for me, but we love the community. We love the, the business. We love... Um, being able to see people and, and have them be excited about our products. And that's yeah. the constant feedback that we get is the products that we 
make and provide to the community mm -hmm. actually keeps HEMA alive in right. the U.S. And I've heard that several times just this weekend. Um, you know, the, the nylon swords that Christian developed with mm -hmm. the help of, you know, Axel and Anders from GFS, GFHS, um, that has really been a boost for the for the community mm -hmm. in order to provide weapons for tournaments and just keep the art growing. Yeah. Which we have used today and yes. will be actually featuring as one of the tournaments for t tonight. Yes. So, yeah. And uh, let's not also forget that um, you're also providing the daggers for a dagger tournament. Yes. Uh, the, the first of a series of prototypes. Uh, and uh, again, a, a, a big jump up from the last prototype that we uh, we got uh, when we ran the same basic uh, mm -hmm. self-defense dagger tournament mm -hmm. at FA this year. So. And all the credit to the prototyping goes to Christian. Um, he, that that is his passion is to engineer right. the best product. Right. So he's given a challenge to make something, and he'll make it, and then mm -hmm. he'll strive to make it better. So, um, which is bad for me sometimes because I'm not able to. <laughs> stock something for a long time before he makes a little bit mm, yeah. of a tweak That's and a true. little bit of a change but he does enjoy the engineering aspect of it that's his that's his trade is engineering yeah. and so he's able to um, take a problem engineer it through and solve it yeah. Yeah. and uh, so in that regard I mean I think you guys in terms of your products are, are one of the f fastest evolving constantly evolving you know companies out there in terms of your product mm -hmm. line so well, and that too, that's, that's been another focus of ours is to, you know, for, fit, for the first 15 years uh, or 15 years ago, we started out making wooden wasters right, right. and they were, they were used widely. They were heralded as, oh, you know, we can, well, and actually, I mean, it's not that our wasters are, you know, just spectacular, yeah. They, yeah. but it was the fact that, you know, the, our business model was to try to get it to you in a timely manner, and and that was that was what we focused on. Um, but as time went on, wooden wasters sort of fell out of favor for the right. the daily training it, purposes. Yeah, the needs evolved. The right? needs evolved, yeah. and so yeah. we evolved with that. And now our goal is to be the one-stop shop, because the European right. market has evolved a little bit faster mm -hmm. as far as some of the sparring gear um, and equipment, mm -hmm. and so we've. Um, We've tried to be in contact with those European vendors and bring it over. So if you want a special jacket and a M blade swing and a right, right. you know um, a book from uh, by Zabinski, you can come and get that from us. Right, so that's right. so been our business model now for the last couple of years is to try to expand and be the one-stop shop. Well, since you mentioned it, then um, what what would you say are, are some of the the newest things that you're offering? Is there anything? I mean, the daggers are obviously new. The daggers are new. Um, we. Oh my. <laughs> Never mind the hammering. <laughs> Never mind the hammering. Um, That's we. Standard process. <laughs> Christian has, um, and I wish I had it here. Christian wor has been working on a synthetic messer uh, with a metal nagel for hand protection. Right, right. Um, I have. I had one here I this think I've weekend. Seen those, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm not really sure what what else Christian has cooking. You know, sometimes hard to he'll. Keep track, right? It's hard to keep up with absolutely, him. So, absolutely. I just I get an order and I I try to get it out the door. So. <laughs> right. I can understand why that's a full time job. Mm -hmm. So uh, essentially, Christian sort of handles the R and D side of the business, and you handle the front end, dealing with customers and clients, shipping and that sort of thing. And I would be very remiss if I did not mention that London and Evan, our children. Um, are very involved as well. Um, London will answer phone calls and do shipping quotes and do shipping labels for me, so she's very involved in that as well. Um, Evan can go outside and work on swords and w the sabers, the welding on the sabers, he's actually doing that. And so they're, they're helping in the business as well. Yeah, that's really exciting. I've been uh, over to the shop a few times and, uh, Started to talk to Christian and realized I was talking to Evan by accident. <laughs> so pretty, pretty exciting stuff. Yep. And uh, I mean, one thing you've done remarkably well is adapt to the times. Uh, you know, adapt to the market as the market continues to grow. Do you have a Do you have any anticipations or expectations for which way the market will go in the near future? Well, there's a lot of interest in the steel faders, um, and so we are also importing the. Oh, I guess they're done. 
We are importing the Ensifer faders um, from Poland, and that there seems to be a, um, a need for the, the steel swords, but the, the nylons are great and they are you know widely used and I could see I foresee that those will be used into the future. So. Right. And in fact actually I suppose that's probably a good opportunity to talk at least start talking uh, about the uh, the difference the weapons uh, in terms of the long swords that we're using today. Because mm -hmm. we're actually using both the nylons and the steel. Yes. But we'll get to that. All right, All right. finally thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. We're gonna move back over now to the cutting. Uh, I believe we had an issue with the stand that is now resolved. So James Clark is cutting it. Oh, he just shanked one there. Yep. Uh, we made a first good run through, and a little bit of a Oop, hiccup there. Little, on that a little one. bit of a there. Targeting issue. Oh boy. Okay. James is uh, I'm not sure how much cutting. He's really trying to bring my big wide swings. Uh, that he works with his Montante to the action. Uh, I spoke with him a little earlier about his approach to this, and um, he really was trying to tie it into his Montante training. So yeah. that's always exciting to me to see a guy branching out into something, uh, another aspect of the historic swordsmanship. Yeah. Right. And it is interesting how those weapon mechanics then translate over to, uh, you know, the other uh, skill sets that you apply in, in other areas. So, um, and that's a big part of what this event is, is all about. So uh, that puts us uh, at the end of the second participant. No, third. Uh, third, I'm sorry. I need to learn how to count again. But so uh, that's James Clark, number three. And uh, next up, we'll be doing uh, Tristan Zakowski, be the final uh, person uh, to go here. And uh, hopefully, uh, the stand issues resolved. So we'll do this relatively quickly um, with them setting up the mats. All right. Yeah, Tristan's out of New York, and they had quite a big showing of fellows uh, come up this weekend. I was impressed, yeah. I mean, um, clearly uh, Tristan's group has uh, grown very, very quickly. And, uh, you know, I, I get a chance to actually watch some of these guys fight. Um, I, I think, you know, they are they're, uh, uh, they were, you know, doing a good job of really working working the basics. Um, and uh, so I, I think the, the tournament, seemed, from, from the feedback that I got from them, it seemed like the, you know, uh, the experience of, of uh, doing the tournament was really good feedback, which is really, uh, you know, technical feedback, both in terms of tactics and mechanics. So, you know, that's what you want. You want this, this tournament experience to really give them some practical feedback that they can then use to, to work on their own techniques and figure out what, you know, what, quote, works. Well, sure, absolutely. I didn't get a chance to talk with all of the guys. Um, but I did talk with a number of them, and I gathered that for at least some of them, this is their first uh, tournament outing. I believe so, yeah. Right. And uh, right. they, you know, typical first tournament jitters, not knowing what to expect, and, you know, not really uh, sure how you know, the judging process and all those protocols work. But uh, a lot of them adapted, and we saw some exciting stuff later on. And so uh, I'm going to scoot over now and make room for... We have Charles Murdoch. Uh, so continuing the uh, the trend here of uh, some local instructors before we get uh, to instructors further abroad. Uh, welcome to Charles Murdoch. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, so do you want you want to talk tell us a little bit about uh, you know your background and where you're coming from and your interest too? Yeah, I've been uh, with the Meyer Fry Factor Guild for about four years. Started a study group in Vermont about three years ago, mm -hmm. and I've been working through Meyer's 1570 translated by Dr. Corkin. Okay, very good. So you're interested in Meyer, certainly. Um, and uh, if I remember correctly, one of the reasons I wanted to, uh, to to chat with you a little bit on the live stream is uh, 
I think you have uh, some reasonably good insight into uh, the next event that's going to be coming up, uh, that is uh, the wrestling, right? So uh, I believe you did reasonably well at uh, another event earlier this year, Long Point. Yes. Uh, enough to get a very, very snazzy looking uh, uh, wrestling jacket from uh, one of uh, the uh, the community's uh, own um, Jess Finley, who uh, is part of Feeling Designs, and I'm sure we have a logo that will pop up, you know, relatively soon. But uh, um, yeah, so so, uh, what did you think of uh, her product? Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. It, she tailors them to you. It fits so well. Comfortable to wrestle in. It was it was great. Yeah. So yeah, so um, we are actually going to be providing. Uh, a, a, n a couple of those as prizes because we have the two different weight classes. Um, so so uh, hopefully more of those products will get spread around because of that. So, um, but yeah, so tell us a little bit about your experience, you know, your personal experience from a wrestling perspective and, you know, how you view these different uh, wrestling formats that are being used for a competitive uh, approach uh, for HEMA. Well, it's interesting because they have a lot of background in other martial arts, but mm -hmm. it's really nice to be able to work from um, formats like Dusk Rubon and Scottish Backhold Wrestling, mm -hmm. um, and, and know that wrestling is just across the board a very similar skill set, mm. okay. and, but it's really nice to be able to work within the traditional means right. of the question. Right, right. And, you know, again, that's that's something that's probably worth mentioning about this particular event, that, you know, our approach was to, to really look at historical-based tournament formats as much as we could. Uh, so, so with the wrestling, we chose a historical format, which exists, you know, even to this day, uh, practiced quite a bit by the Scots. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, the, one of the nice advantages of this rule set is that it's super, super easy to uh, to 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 uh, implement uh, as a competitive format, as well as to, uh, I think, uh, learn. So, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about your experience, kind of playing with the, the back hold? What's what's your feeling on it? I can also vouch that it's very tiring. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's amazing. I mean, yeah. um, especially in the heavyweight, you have big guys leaning right. on you, and it's a it's a but it's a great experience. Right. Um, very uh, subtle, hmm. and some really great, as we see in the finals, some really great um, practitioners of, of these arts. Okay. Fantastic. Very good. Um, and this, I think the spear format, as well. Speaking of, of other formats, has been fantastic. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I believe we'll see you. Um, uh, we'll, we might get a chance to talk to you a little bit uh, further, but uh, thanks very much. And we're going to take a look at uh, Tristan now as awesome. the fourth and final cutter. Thanks. Thank you. So Christian working some shifting grip positions. Uh, oh, cool. All over house, changing edges. A little trouble with the linen. Nice and smooth though. Tristan is he's got great mechanics, great smooth mechanics. Oh. Down to the tough parts now. <laughs> Changed his mind on that's right. really getting Very set, good. taking oh, a nice yeah. solid base. Oh, tough. Defeated a bit by the winner there. <laughs> All right, so a, uh, a pretty good showing from Tristan. Um, uh, as, as a bit of a background here, we uh, uh, we know Tristan from, again, New York Historical Fencing Association, and also from the fact that I believe he won the cutting um, at, uh, as I mentioned, another one of the events earlier this year, Long Point, uh, down in Maryland. Uh, so, you know, he's, uh, he's got plenty of ability and talent, uh, and, uh, you know, it, 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 the fact that he was, uh, he was having trouble with the linen kind of demonstrates the fact that, you know, that's a pretty difficult thing to, uh, to cut through. So, I have with me uh, Bill here from uh, New England KDF. Hey guys, uh, how you doing? <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. So, uh, so I know you—you you were actually one of our instructors uh, for uh, for our cutting class, mm -hmm. uh, along with Tristan, over the course of the weekend. So, do uh, you have any comments about um, you know cutting in general, or any of the performances that you've seen so far? I think uh, overall the performances today have been excellent. I've seen uh, really good technical abilities out there. Some really good skills. So we have the results of the cutting tournaments now, uh, taking 
Taking fourth place is Tristan Zukowski. Taking third place is James Clark. Taking second place is Ben Hawkins. Taking first place is Andrew Kilgore. So pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> nice smile, Stephen. Nice smile. So, um, all right. So uh, there we have it. That is the first of our tournaments concluded. Uh, and uh, yeah. So before we leave it, um, uh, any thoughts, Bill, about um, how things turned out? I was uh, fairly surprised. Uh, the cutting today was well beyond normal technical stuff we've seen in the mm -hmm. past before. I'm sure. glad to see. Uh, more dynamics and cutting, which is right. something that we've been sorely missing in yep. our competitions where it's been static right. targets, nobody's moving, nobody's walking. Right. Right. Uh, it's good to see our art being portrayed not just as you know, the tournaments here, mm -hmm. but actually showing a little bit more of what we can actually do with the sword to a target in a dynamic environment. And right. That's real pleasurable to see that. Right, right. Um, so I guess in, in terms of the actual result of the, the tournament, um, I mean, I, I think, uh, I'm curious, did he report the scores between the, the, the first and second place? I didn't hear that. I, didn't, I don't remember hearing, but I, I imagine it was probably close. I think it was So what do, you, what do you think were sort of the, the defining factors that... I know, think at made, the, at the end of that, yeah. the, the, definite, the, the big difference was the ability for a person to move quickly from one target to another, okay. seeing their target and immediately going to the cut instead of that pause between targets. I see. So the ability right. for them to react quickly is definitely going to be the deciding factor there. They actually reacted much faster, saw the target, went immediately into the cut instead of pausing to get their bearings. They knew their target environment and they cut their target immediately. Interesting. Okay. So, yeah, and, and I guess uh, there's certainly more than one way to look at what the priorities are for cutting, right? Mm -hmm. So so. Um, you know, I think one of the things that happens with all of these tournaments is we're still sort of feeling our way out uh, around, uh, you know, what are the priorities and, and what happens if we weigh this over mm -hmm. that or whatever. So um, w with cutting, I think, how many different metrics did they have for, for measuring things? I think it was like half a dozen at least. Definitely half a dozen, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You know, you had, you had speed, you had uh, accuracy, you had... Um, quality of the cut, you had difficulty of the cut, you know, let's face it, somebody doing a Zornhau versus somebody doing a Crump pile, those are two totally different levels of cutting, right. especially against the linen. I mean, once you right. involve that linen in there, that's really going to show a lot more technical ability with your cut than just cutting bare tatami. Hmm. Moving to the Baron was another thing too, which is something we haven't done in the past, where right. we've actually changed moving from a Creasy, which is a very good cutting sword, to the Baron, which nobody's really handled before, and it's a totally right. different type of blade. Right, and that was one of the things that, I, as an event organizer, I, I wanted to uh, to try to start incorporating the idea of, uh, di again, in terms of skill sets, mm -hmm. trying to be able to move between different uh, uh, weapons, different tools mm -hmm. that you have to uh, I think it showed. Yeah, I definitely think it showed. Yeah. I, so I, think, think, it uh, showed. I think that was uh, that made things pretty interesting. So, Absolutely. Um, so along the way, uh, if we get a chance to uh, talk with the competitors, it might be interesting to find out what their experience was. But uh, yeah, I, I think uh, hopefully they they had a good time with it. So um, so having said that, um, now now tell us a little bit about yourself now. So so I mean obviously you have a background in cutting. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you have a background in quite a number of other things as well. I mean, you had a class here on, on Harnish Vector, mm -hmm. right. which, um, you know, is, is something that is, it's kind of interesting for this community in the sense that I think we're all interested in historical things. Um, but uh, it's 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 a little bit difficult to get into that simply from just a price point some of the time. Absolutely. So, so what is what is your feel in terms of how, you know, I, I think it's certainly a worthwhile thing to, to look at, but how do we bridge the gap of trying to get more people into that? Well, you know, I, I like to explain it as, you know, especially on the German side, and unfortunately I can't really speak about the Italian mm -hmm. side of the house, but, you know, the Germans didn't just do Blosch fashion. You know, Hunnich fashion was a very important part of their martial art. Right. So you did unarmored combat and you did armored combat as well. Right, right. You're, you're very right. The, the cost of getting into a set of even half-decent armor that works is, you know, three four $4,000. Yeah. But what it brings to the table is the ability to, you know, not just use steel weapons, but also use pole axes in the way they were designed right. To do much instead. heavier duty exactly weapons. Right, right and so you actually get to see more of the 
what the martial art was about. Right. You know, the takedowns right. with the weapon versus right. just the strikes with the weapons. Right. You get to see something totally different. I mean, let's face yeah. it, seeing somebody in a full harness out on a field doing their martial prowess yeah. is a pretty impressive sight right. when these people wearing 40, right. 50, 60 pounds of armor. Yeah, I mean, again, talking about different skill sets, would you agree that, you know, the skill set for using the same weapon you know, uh, in armor and out of armor, it can be very different. Oh yeah, I mean, let's let's face it. You're usually using a long sword and a standard two-hand or one-handed grip when you're doing blast fashion. When you do harness fashion, now you're moving to the half sorting techniques, right. where you're right. actually putting your hand on the blade and using that to get into the weaker areas of the armor, like let's say the armpits or the groin or even the neck and the visor slit, which is a whole other way of fighting. And also. With armor, you're going to the grapple a lot faster <laughs> than you do when you're unarmored. So, yeah, now, okay, so I think it's, it's, it's important to remember that, you know, I'm not sure who all our viewers are, but there may be some that uh, are not intimately familiar with uh, a lot of these, these things. Like So, so when we say Blosfechten, uh, literally, I believe that translates as naked fighting. Yes, right? naked so, fighting. So, in other words, unarmed, unarmored fighting. And the Harnischfechten is the armored fighting. Correct. Right? So, um, so, all right, so I think that's a bit of an introduction into that world, which is, you know, uh, hopefully we'll see more of, uh, ultimately. Excellent. So, thank you very much, Thanks Bill. for your time, guys. I appreciate yep. it. Yep. So, I think we're moving on to our next event now, uh, and we will be doing, uh, as we were talking with uh, Charles Murdoch just a few minutes ago, uh, our wrestling tournament, uh, which is based on that, that uh, traditional Scottish backhold uh, kind of wrestling. So, um, uh, we will be uh, talking about uh, the fighters uh, in just a moment. Uh, but uh, Scott, I know you got a, a good background in, in wrestling as well, right? I mean, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your perspective of what the, the Scottish backhold game is like? What can we expect to see? <clears throat> well, as a, the name implies, it's backhold, so they'll be wrapping their arms around each other uh, in a particular grip, uh, one or two particular grips, uh, and then attempting to take each other down, largely via footwork and uh, misplacement of uh, center of gravity. Um, it's like a lot of historical rule sets, what it does is it isolates uh, specific skill sets, uh, allowing the competitors to focus on those and improve those. Uh, and it is quite interesting to see that the guys who've done quite well in this, um, both this year and last year, um, <clears throat> a number of people remarked, uh, and I noticed myself, that these guys were actually also pulling off um, the uh, a number of actual technical uh, throws in their long sword play. So this isolation of skill sets does not help. Now, for the uh, two lucky victims, I mean, competitors that will be doing this, uh, we actually have two pairs of people. Casper uh, Anderson and Nathan Weston will be first up for our lightweight division. Yeah. 
Okay. So right. Casper is out of the Triangle uh, Sword Guild in, uh, what is that? So I believe they're based in North Carolina. North Carolina, North right. Carolina. He's yeah. training over there with them. Uh, Ben Strickling. Ben Strickling, yep. Who's actually walking up here on the mat right now. Uh, so he's, he's going to be here as a coach, coaching his guy, Casper. Uh, and then on the other side, we also have Nathan Weston, who uh, uh, belongs to Athena, uh, uh, Athena School of Arms, uh, one of our local groups uh, in Boston, uh, and uh, uh, is, uh, is actually, again, um, uh, headed up by uh, Stephen Hirsch, who was uh, uh, managing the, the cutting tournament as well. So we've got uh, two, you know, pretty good, uh, pre pretty good competitors here um, in the li that lightweight division. Although, yeah, I'm curious to see. Uh, uh, I'm curious to see how this is going to work out between the two of them in terms of rules. However, uh, so it's again, I said earlier, it's a it's a simple format, and it's it's simply the best of three falls, um, where a fall is simply defines any part of the body touching the floor that is not the feet. Okay, so they need to, to do the grip. They need to make the opponent fall, uh, and make the opponent fall first to get the fall. And here we go. Wrestle. All right, so they've got that clinch on both sides. They're circling. Right, they're circling, looking yeah. for a position, yeah. trying to that, work the physical okay. strength. And watch the feet. A lot of the time there's Nathan's position got a feet pretty good oh, look, a little hook. There he goes. Oh, nice. Nicely done by Casper. Yeah. Nathan lifted up his foot to make the heel hook, and Casper took advantage of that and made a nice counter to yeah. the left. Yeah. Red. All right, so Casper needs one more. He'd be able to win this bout here. Oh, he's, 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 oh, oh, and he yeah, does he get it. it. He made it work. How made did it the work. judges score? Do they see the reverse? Okay. Judges. Blue. Okay, so the judges have scored one. one for each fighter. Ready. Nope. Wrestle. Will be the decision here. Oh, Ooh, nice, nice reverse. reverse by Nathan West. Yes, Michelle, nice job. <clears throat> I think Casper just got a little eager to Red. make that uh, hip throw. Yeah. Turned his hips in a little too quickly there uh, before he had him. Nathan's balance correct. Um, and Nathan was able to take advantage of that and turn it back around. Okay, so that's the end of round one. And uh, as uh, in general for this uh, this series of finals, we're going to be doing best two of three matches. So what? Well, actually, oh, uh, or not? <laughs> So that's the lightweights. And no, it was not. So I mean I'm fine doing that. Okay. No one was clear. So a bit of confusion there. Um, uh, so, it, and, and part of the confusion actually for finals um, in backhold, traditional backhold, uh, um, I believe uh, a lot of the time, you know, the actual early rounds are best, uh, best of three, but when they go to the finals, they actually do best of five uh, and end it there. But now instead of that, we're going to be. Ooh, well, that oh, was quick. That was quick. And it looks like uh, Nathan might have had the wind knocked out of him just a little bit, just a little bit. Yeah, his that leg off. got trapped under him. That, I think that came on a little too fast. He uh, may be checking out his knee there. Um, I don't think 
he was ready for Casper to be quite so explosive right out the gate. So <clears throat> these are the sorts of things that certainly can come up with wrestling, though, and, and you know, in terms of uh, competitive formats for rest for uh, HEMA in general, um, wrestling can be uh, pretty tricky, right, in terms of safety. Well, sure, it's a contact sport. Yeah. Uh, let's see what he can do. So that he starts on a much lower base. Oh, uh, almost. Oh, and, uh, let's see how the judges score that. Blue. Uh, they gave it to Blue. Round two goes to Blue. And Nathan Ritz. Perhaps he landed uh, with Casper's hands under him. Uh, oh, I can hear, I can hear Nathan saying to the uh, referee that his knee is hurt there, so he's gonna. Gonna probably forfeit it looks here. He doesn't want to risk any more yep. greater injury. Right. It's not worth injuring yourself over unnecessarily. So. I perhaps he means the fall before that. He tried to get one more out there to see how it goes and doesn't feel good about it. So he may be erring on the side of caution to protect himself for future events, which is a smart decision by a, a great competitor. So the winner by default goes to Costco. Uh, that's the winners of our lightweight division. Coming up next is our heavyweight division, which will include Ben Jarasho from Maryland KDF down in Baltimore. Okay, and now we have our heavy And followed, uh, fighting against uh, First is Andrew Jarosho Kilgore, Jarosho once again from the Athena School KDF. of Arms. Uh, both of these guys have some really dynamic rounds uh, during the pool fights and whatnot. So it will be very exciting to see if they are able to get warmed up quick enough. And get in the game and stay focused to this group. So uh, it's not clear, but I'm going to assume that uh, Andrew will be listed as the red fighter and that Ben will be the blue fighter. Fighter's race. A little bit of uh, sport. uh, good sportsmanship by those guys there. And here we go. And uh, I know that these guys had a matchup last year actually and uh, it was close. These guys very similar in white knives. Oh, yes. yeah. I believe um, Ben actually has a background in, in high school high school wrestling. Right. So, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think Andrew does as well. Yeah, yeah. So I imagine those skill sets are uh, coming back into play here. Oh looking oh almost almost not quite not quite looking for oh can you get it over almost Oh, he's going to get reversed. Oh, he got reversed. It's good work by Andrew. Yeah, we let the uh, the clinch get a little high on the shoulders there. Two for red. uh, Round one goes red. And again, we're reminded that uh, this is uh, (laughs) both a contact sport and a cardiovascular uh, trial by fire. Yeah. Wrestling is very uh, draining sport. Um, it's Rest. worth noting that while Ben might be... Oh, oh nice! Oh, nice! nice. Uh, Inside hook. Uh, and I was just getting ready to comment that Andrew's Blue. taller, and so if Ben's going to take advantage of that, ready. he's going to have to stand that guy up. <laughs> and he did a great job there. Rest. Really nicely done. So, oh, so oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> So it could have been called what is was known as a dog fall, in which case uh, it's sort of the equivalent of double hit uh, in other you know, sort of weapon formats where 
two things happen simultaneously that are equally weighted, e equally bad, you know. Um, okay, um, but, um, so Andrew stepped off the mat, seems to be grabbing a glass of water. Uh, huh. Quick 30 second break, presumably. Which I don't begrudge them, considering how, uh, how tiring this can be. Judge is ready. Fighter's ready. Looks like we're going to do one more bout here. So this will be the deciding bout. Wrestle. Oh, no. Nice. Oh! Yes. And it will be interesting to see how the judges proceed. Judge is ready. I think Ben got that one. Oh. But it looks like it is the dog. Dog ball. Which is, I'm sure, something neither of them ready. really wants to hear. Wrestle. Nice. Attempted a hook. Nice really working the upper body, trying to go inside. Oh! oh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That didn't look good. Oh. Oh, ben. <laughs> so, it seems like Andrew's all right, just needs to shake it off a little bit. Red. It's going to go red. Another one in Andrew's favor. Taking a little bit of a breather. Ready. <sighs> Wrestle. And as they get more tired, I'm just going to see what happens to the technique. Inside left here again. It's really like <laughs> oh, yeah, it looks like you probably got it. Giving that yeah. to Blue. Yeah. Blue. All right. In the third round, side one round apiece. That's conditioning is surprisingly good. Uh, uh, given that he's probably got 10 years or more on uh, Andrew. Um, I think that may be uh, a long time veteran wrestler. Uh, he seems to be remaining rather calm. Oh, yeah. the <laughs> Here we go. Some more good sportsmanship. And. Wrestle! He set Andrew up that he would go inside each time with that left leg, and then uh, when it came down to the game point, he went outside, stuck behind, and then really good play. Nicely done by Ben Zerrison. Right All right. So I'm going to step aside so you can have a short interview here with uh, Mr. Jeremy Steffleck. Jeremy Steffleck, yet another local. Good New England event with great New England instructors. Welcome. Oh, thank you. So, um, we, uh, we wanted to bring you here on board to uh, talk a little bit uh, in advance of the Dagger Tournament, which will be coming up pretty soon. But uh, uh, you were one of the, well, uh, early, uh, I believe, victims of our uh, attempts at uh, uh, playing with the Dagger Tournament a yes. number of years ago. And uh, so, yeah, was it only two years ago? It was ago? only two years ago. It's amazing. It's amazing. So, you know, I, I'm curious to hear your perspective on how things have evolved from, you know, our, you know, our very first attempt to, to what, what it is at this point. So the, the rule sets, I think, are, are much more advanced and much more appropriate for what we're doing. You know, the, the, the three strikes instead of just one. Right, um, and and I, bear in mind the I, I don't know that the audience really knows what the rules right. yet are. So, okay. so, um, so here let's 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 set this up a little bit. Um, in terms of the rule set uh, that you're about to see uh, implemented for the tournament, um, it's uh, it there's a sort of historical um, there is a historical uh, element called uh, the, the concept of counted blows yes. that um, that we are implementing, and it's very simple. The idea is that there is a certain number of blows that needs to land on target um, before the action stops. So um, in this particular case for the dagger, um, uh, we were, we we're going to be looking for the dagger to land on target, which is head, head or torso, uh, three times successfully. Um, so what you're going to see is uh, honestly a lot of stabbing. And that is one of the key things that differentiates this rule set from the very first rule set that we did, which was a, a sing, basically a single touch and stop kind of right. situation. Uh, and I think it's actually really important for, you know, bridging that gap between, um, you know, sort of uh, 
point fighting to to more of the the realistic uh, sort of dagger um, practical dagger uh, fighting that, that right. you kind there, of see. There is absolutely nothing pretty about a knife fight. Right. It's fast. Right. It's brutal. Um, you know, at its best, I think it resembles a bar fight. Uh, <laughs> right. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Um, it's it just it's fast and brutal, and I think with this type of rule set, we can really uh, start getting into that a little bit more because it is. You know, multiple blows, multiple uh, uninterrupted time. It's yeah, well, this is um, we're playing a little musical interview here. Yeah. Interviewee here, uh, <laughs> Jeff's got to go handle a, a technical issue. Never fun um, running an event, <laughs> as you know. Uh, yeah, they're, they're a great time. Yeah. Um, so, well, how do you feel about this rule set in general? Do you like that the, the rule set incorporates this action, keeps the action going, and, and tries to get the fighters to engage? I, I do. Uh, I, I like that. I like the, the longer exchanges you end up getting. Um, I think with the, the self-defense dagger that we did first was, was, was excellent. Um, I, I love that format. The dagger-to-dagger -dagger fighting, uh, also excellent, and I believe that's what we're going to be seeing here later in, in a few minutes. I'm not entirely clear. I think we're going to do <laughs> one of the... Self defense, and, or, then, yeah. or, and then one self defense beating uh, one person is armed and one person is unarmed, and then they'll swap roles. Mm -hmm. uh, dagger versus dagger, both, both fighters have uh, a dagger. Uh, excellent. Um, so I'm hoping we see one of each, but the the schedule is having to be uh, adjusted kind of on the fly here due to the technical difficulties earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so assuming that it's dagger versus dagger, so let me just shift topics here a little bit. Mm -hmm. Do you feel? <clears throat> um, well, my take on it, you know, I, I agree with you. I thought the self-defense stuff, the self-defense game was, was quite exciting. We saw a lot of actual techniques worked from the manuals uh, in a number of ways, uh, up to throws and, and locks, and I saw a wonderful arm bar uh, during one of the rounds. Um, yeah, some and, nice upper keys too. Was, there was some really good techniques. Yeah, the the so. format of the of the dagger tournament allows this stuff to happen in a you know in a competitive and exciting um, you know in a non-compliant manner. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the dagger versus dagger, this was the first year they'd introduced that. Well, second. So two years ago, it was only dagger versus dagger. Oh, well, okay, so but under this under, structure, under the, this the, rule the set. counted blows, yeah, and yeah. The gang, yes. um, I, I, there was obviously a lot of stabbing <laughs> uh, and a lot of action, but I felt that the the, the, the degree of technique wasn't quite the same. Uh, it wasn't as present as we saw in the... Right, you had a lot more people instead of uh, you're fighting with the dagger forward, like most of the men, you'll say, you know, your, your lead foot, your dagger's forward. Mm -hmm. um, There's a lot more keeping the dagger back and out of the way and using the lead hand, the, the empty hand, to create the opening to bring it in. And yes, that shows up in some of the techniques, but it's always you keep your weapon in front. You, you, you keep that so it's threatening, so you can counter anything. You counter with that before you bring your other hand in. Right, I felt that I felt very similar that you, we saw uh, not as much, you know, bringing the dagger hand mm -hmm. against the other dagger and you know locks and keys. Yeah, uh, you, didn't, you didn't see the counter stabs. You didn't yeah. see the you know the, the, the locks with the dagger incorporation. Yeah. It's, but it's, now, it's tough to do. This is still you know, very much experimental. Right, and that's what I was going to say. Would you would you agree with me that this is, you know, since this is sort of the first outing and a lot of people aren't honestly training this on a regular basis. Well, a lot of this may just be uh, getting used to knowing you know, the right. format and the rules. And I think in two years, if we continue along this vein, we're going to start seeing a lot, Sorry. a lot better technique. <laughs> a two bouté stabbing in the back, <laughs> low blow, man, low blow. It was pretty high, actually. I thought. Mm. Anyway, so I, actually, I thought uh, it might be good to kind of demonstrate what it is that we're, we're dealing with yeah, so in this tournament. These are, I believe, John Connor's second version of the dagger, third generation. Um, right. Well, actually, I think so. So John O'Connor, art from Forte Productions, mm -hmm. was really the one who was kind of behind the, the fundamental uh, engineering behind it. You know, so he did the original prototype, and Christian has since then kind of taken it up to okay. a couple of different levels. So, so before we had, you know, the spring, the spring component of this. You know, that's one of the key things that makes this work, but still stiff enough that you can actually parry with it, lever with it. Um, uh, and then what Christian did was uh, take it from sort of a leather-covered approach to really to like a foam, foam, foam and latex. So, yeah. Yeah, and th these are fantastic. Yeah, um, pretty cool. Um, I would like a little bit more travel. Yes. Yep. But other than that, it, it's it's a great great little toy to play yeah. with. Yep. So I think uh, again, I think you know a lot of the different arts out there, like the like Fiore, where where they talk about actually. Um, you know, uh, comp uh, actually, you know, stabbing with this stuff and doing all these actions. You know, it'd be great if they started competing with these sorts of things mm -hmm. to see what happens with yeah. the technique, right? 
Yeah, and um, so just as a, a word of note for the audience, wondering perhaps why there's the orange knob on the end, um, this was uh, an attempt we found out in previous iterations of the dagger tournament, putting orange tape or something visual actually helped um, judges uh, identify tar targets on Otherwise, tap. Otherwise you're trying to identify a black point going into what are mostly black jackets, you lose the point. It's yeah, and it helps track the, track, helps the eye track it. Mm -hmm. um, we've also can point out that when the dagger collapses, that gives, even though it's happening very fast, uh, you know, at the speed a lot of these guys are, are, are competing at, um, but even that little collapse helps the judge's eye identify um, the action going on, and when a, when you know when a stab has actually hit and you know, press yeah. release versus when it's just barely missed mm -hmm. and not. So very clever design uh, by Purple Heart, and you know uh, originally engineered by John yeah. O'Connor. So actually, yeah, the, we were working with a version of this dagger that uh, had, and I almost I, I almost don't want to say this on camera, um, but we hooked it up to uh, the Hitmate scoring for Olympic fencing. Mm -hmm. So two inches of travel and then a buzz. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. It was fun to play with, but yeah, I don't think I can say that on, on camera. Well, no, <laughs> I think you can, and I think uh, opening the sport fencing can of worms into the dagger community is uh, it's very to, exciting. I had to do it. You know no, the, the, that, that is your right. No, the, the, the dagger tournament, you know, bottom line, I think it's going to be a great fight coming up. Uh, yeah. I hope to see a lot of good technique. Right, right. Um, now, what I'm what I'm hearing, and they will confirm this for us, I'm sure. But what I'm hearing is that, unfortunately, um, Nathan Weston, who was injured just earlier, who was one of the competitors for the uh, lightweight dagger. Unfortunately, so uh, what's going to happen? Um, yeah, they're looking right now to see if there's another viable fighter to, to fight in his place. But if not, we will we will uh, very possibly just see the, the heavyweights actually go through the uh, the dagger rounds. So, can you clarify for us, Jeff, are we going to be seeing the self-defense dagger and then the dagger versus dagger, or are we just seeing one of those events? No, I, I think what we're going to be doing is we'll start with the self-defense uh, and basically do a full bout of that and mm -hmm. accumulate the points okay. uh, from that bout and then go directly into the other format, which is the dagger versus dagger, uh, and continue to tally those points. So, whoever has the most points uh, at the end of that day uh, for the two fighters will be the winner. So, right. speaking of which... Yeah, I think my time is up, so... Yeah, and uh, thank you very much uh, for anytime. your input. Yep. Thanks for coming, yep. man. Self-defense dagger finals, we've got uh, Casper Anderson, he was originally scheduled to fight against Nathan Weston, and I believe this gentleman's name is Sean... Uh, McCoy. Sean McCoy, that's, that's correct. Right. Right. So he's looking for those three stabs now. Right. I don't believe any of them... Oh, that so may have landed, that may have landed. Defender. Oh, right in the head. So as a defender, oh, yeah, oh. Casper's not allowed to begin movement yeah. until um, Sean engages. Once he does engage, he can move freely about the ring uh, and try to avoid the three stabs necessary uh, by the attacker, Sean McCoy. Um, and did you, I'm sorry, Jeff, I didn't catch yeah, how the judges scored that. Did you catch that score? Uh, well, according to the graphic, it looks like Sean got that, that point. So the attacker was successful, landing three three blows. Ooh. Oh, kick axe. Very good. Oh, 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 oh. oh, interesting, interesting. Judges. Now, will that be considered control or a control takedown? That is the question. Uh, and blue is Casper. So they're gonna give that to the defender. Give that to the defender. And you know what, I I, I can go with that. Yeah. He clearly turned. And now the question is, what is the value? So two of the judges are seeing that it was a control takedown. One is... Oh, so they're debating, was it a ring out? Was it a ring out or was it a control takedown? Uh, in this particular format, we've got uh, three points. Three points for a controlled, uh, 
All right, control takedown versus uh, a ring out, which is one point. Uh, Casper's turn to take the attack, and he's going with the left. Oh, uh, left -handed man. Grip. Nice. Yep. Which is a, I'm not sure if he's left-handed. I don't recall one him point being left-handed in the, in the sword arts, but he right, may right. be doing this as a strategy, knowing that many guys right. are not comfortable pairing with that right hand. Um, and in fact, Sean has not seemed to adjust his stance to deal with that. Working with his right hand on the back, uh, or right foot on the rear of his position. Oh. Um, yeah, pretty solid strikes by Casper Value. there. And yeah, the judges all agree. So. All right. Um, that is the first round of dagger self defense. We will now all right. progress to dagger versus dagger. So. All right, looks like we've got a little conference on how we're going to manage this. Um, it's a real shame Nathan West had to step out. Uh, it's created a little bit of, not only for him as a competitor, but it's also created a little bit of a hiccup here for the staff in terms of making some certain adjustments uh, behind the scenes. Uh, so while we deal with that, why don't we go and talk about some of our other great sponsors. Um, oh, hold. I'm getting a hold here. So, looks like we're dealing with another technical issue. So here we go, the fighters are ready to go again for, uh, I assume, round two. Uh, this is the dagger versus dagger section. And the score is two for blue, zero for red. And once again, Casper Anderson's going with that left-handed grip, at least he is before the action starts, uh, where Sean McCoy is going to stick with his uh, right-handed grip. Ready. Judges All ready. right, here we go. The camera's back on. Fight. Fight. Just your voice is low. Ooh. Okay, Sean strikes first. Ooh. Oh. So, <clears throat> so um, in terms of what we're looking for here, again, it's the same threshold. We're looking for whoever hits three times successfully first. That will end the action. Oh, yeah. So, so <clears throat> three hits, three successful hits was chosen for the rule set simply because um, it's not too many, too, too many blows to keep track of for both opponents. So, um, so again, we're looking for three clean hits. Are we going to get them? Looks like that might have been two for. Oh, oh, oh and they're calling three there. Okay. Yeah, Sean's really going forward, and he's catching Casper. Uh, anytime you see a fighter with his head pulled back no uh, over a center of agreement, uh, so <laughs> excuse me, center of balance. Um, you know, that's what they call having a guy on the back foot, and it's very hard to fight from that position. Right. Oh, Eric oh, Casper's now, now we got something well, we got interesting. Up here on the dagger, oh. and. Not only a throw, but a throw ring out. out. Of yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now the question is, was there a halt called before that? Judges. And they're giving it to. Uh, and they're giving ooh, it to Blue. Yeah, that's for. Be very difficult not to tie that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Nicely done, Casper is a really nice guy, a fantastic competitor, and the ladies seem to like him. I've noticed. Hopefully that'll get him a nice beverage bottle later this evening. So, congratulations to Casper Anderson. Here we are with our... started collecting, his collection ended up in his home. So, you know, he'd fill up the hallways, the dining room, his study. Um, there are even some family accounts of a suit of armor in a bathtub at one point. 
to the, uh, the, the very end when his wife probably told him, you know, you should do something more with the collection than just putting it in our home. And that's when he decided, you know, maybe I'll start a museum and share my collection with everyone. One of our, our most favorite quotes about John Higgins was when he started showing off his collection to people. And it, it was, if we can strike a spark with our visitors, then we're rewarded. It's, it's specifically focused on the story of arms and armor. However, there are points in our collection, and in fact, I'll show you one of my favorite pieces in, in a minute or two, that also reflect John Higgins and his attitudes and his passions. The night watchman in the sketch was originally going to be John Higgins, but Rockwell was, was so captivated by the museum that he put himself in the picture instead. So the Night Watchman is actually a self-portrait of Norman Rockwell. This helmet here is one of the first off the line that John Higgins helped develop for the US Army. The Japanese consulate to see this helmet had to come to this museum because he had never seen one before in Japan. Some of the other real surprising parts of our non-European collection are, are, are some of these bladed weapons from the Congo. Here at the Higgins, we can tell the story of armor and weapons and warfare. When we move to our new home at the Worcester Art Museum, what will be added is all of the contextual pieces of the story. So when you look at the Japanese conch shell helmet, that will be surrounded by Japanese artwork. So you'll be telling a much greater story, a much richer story. You know, the Worcester Art Museum isn't just looking for you know, this world-class collection of arms and armor. They're looking also to us for how we use the arms and armor and how we tell the stories. You know, it's not just going to be putting the suits of armor on display. You know, you will be able to see knights clanking in the halls of the Worcester Art Museum. Uh, tell me, like, what do you like about the uh, historical European martial arts? Well, it's really a lot of fun. It's not just an exercise thing. It's going really hard with push-ups or squats or anything like that. There's actually a real big historical aspect to fencing and things like that. So it's not just for your exercise buff. It's also for the history buff. <laughs> One of my favorite things about the human community is the fact that we're all just one big family and we can all benefit from sharing information with each other, especially from uh, Maestro Pedersen's teachings. All right, so we're back. Uh, some great uh, promotions there by the Higgins Armory Sword Guild and another fantastic club I'm a big fan of, uh, Sword to Sword out of Houston, Texas. I'm here with uh, Brad Rangel, is that how Rangel, you pronounce yeah. it? Right? Sure. Uh, and Brad, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit of uh, where are you from, what's your specialty? All right, special. Woo! My specialty is Rudy for Andrew. Um, uh, hold on, Brad, it yeah. looks, sorry to interrupt you, but it looks like these guys right. are about to get started. We'll pick this interview up in just a moment. <laughs> Okay, so here we go with the heavyweights. Uh, we've got Andrew Kilgore in the red short, uh, stockings and uh, Ben Strickling in the blue stockings. Presumably they'll use that coloring for the right. As soon as the engagement began, Andrew tried to move forward, uh, get inside that style, uh, inside those thrusts, and push. Then out of the ring, but it didn't seem to work. Hey. All right, here we go. All right. oh. oh, he's going for the... Oh! oh. 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 Well, 
interesting strategy <laughs> and something that has been discussed regarding this is equipment. Do we need to make modifications? But it's a headgear, in absolutely. this case, it was a lucky break that the guy who lost the mask was the guy with the knife, so a little bit less of a hazard there. Right. Yeah, it is interesting that you know so much effort has gone into hand protection, uh, but you know the head is you know, one would think uh, as important, if not more so, than the hands. So. Yeah, uh, there are some folks uh, looking at redesigning masks for HEMA purposes. Um, once again, you have the typical HEMA issue of a lot of needs and a lot, you know, for a lot of fields of right. research. Yep. Here we it's go with Andrew. Oh, Andrew oh, working. Nice. Yeah. Uh, this became a very common strategy throughout the weekend uh, amongst the, the stab high, stab low, stab high. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that's. That's a fine strategy. Hopefully, the, oh, there you go. Oh, See, he's now there, the Ben has figured it out. Uh, as right. soon as he goes, as so soon as they go for that, you really got to shut down that arm, right, exactly. which is what dagger fighting is supposed to do. It's supposed to breed behavior like that. Three points blue. Control. Got right. the judges call that three points blue for control of the arm. So Ben is ahead at five to one. Score is 5-1 after round one. We now move into dagger versus dagger. Okay, so here we go into the dagger versus dagger section where they'll both have a dagger. Uh, ben is leading by five points, and he's got to feel good about that. Uh, Andrew is a very vigorous competitor. Yep. A um, bit of a showman. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's going to be hard for him to come back from that kind of a lead. Um... So I will say these Purple Heart Daggers have really held up through this heavy competition, yeah. even against masks. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, those, the, the metal mesh on the mask. Yeah, yeah the mesh can play a heck on equipment, uh, and they seem to be holding up very fine under pretty heavy conditions this weekend. So um, here we go. Fighters ready. Uh, Fight. Dagger against dagger. Ice picker specifically for this event. Oh, and oh, we got a clinch. Looks like we got a clinch. Oh, nice. oh. nice. Interesting. Uh, once again, Ben was able to stop Andrew's arm, which you know Andrew is a big guy, very powerful man, and interesting that yeah. Ben was able to do that. Yeah. Um, you got to wonder if uh, you know if the uh, the earlier rounds may have maybe ready, impacted ready. Kilgore's ability to to fight at his maximum, but uh, you know. This whole this whole weekend, uh, frankly, has been uh, pretty tough on everybody. Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Bloody exchange. No real control by the arm there, yeah. so a lot of stabbing. Looks like the judges. So. Are in, that both got their yeah, hits. In instances where it's it is not possible for the judges to tell clearly who landed the three blows uh, first, uh, they have been instructed to call this a double hit. Uh, and just as with other. Uh, Tournament formats in, in, in our formats today at IGX, um, uh, once you have three double hits, that will uh, result in a double loss for both fighters. So if uh, that's true, this is the first of... Okay. Let's see what the ruling is here. Zero red. I know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yep. So they confirm so. Ben Strickling, winner, eight to one, against Andrew Kogler. And uh, <clears throat> he's got to feel pretty good because, uh, in terms of how he won, some pretty good technique. Pretty good technique in terms of shutting down that dagger weapon, which is what uh, you know some of the basic stuff that we, we really want to see. Uh, it corresponds with uh, you know, some of the things that you see in the historical treatises. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's just the beginning of, of these sorts of techniques that we want to start seeing from competitors. All right, so uh, looks like we're getting the signal that we're going to have a quick chat with Brad Rangel. All right, so Jeff, why don't you take over sure. and chat with Brad? No problem. I'll chat with you. <laughs> Brad, how, uh, oh, so, uh, as they're uh, taking the mats off the field since we won't be needing these anymore. All right. Um, so what did you think of that last bout? Uh, it was uh, 
quite epic. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes. think, uh, I think Andrew yeah. is a little bit gassed. From yeah, the, yeah from and the... that is something that we were wondering as well, if that would be impacting things. But uh, A little bit. I think yeah. that, uh, that Ben really felt, he looked very comfortable out there. Right. And, um, right. and I think Andrew was, uh, was laboring a little bit, but you know, he's, he's got such a great, Andrew's got a great martial arts background, yeah. as does yeah. Ben, and um, yeah. you see two warriors going there, this is what's going to happen. So right, gonna have absolutely. A, yeah. you know, it's a nice match. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I'm not sure if you covered this earlier, but uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, of your background in terms of where, where you're coming from. Right, sure. Well, uh, we, uh, we have a group in Long Island. Uh, we, so, uh, a little just... bit further down the, the eastern seaboard than that's right. us. But, We're uh, starting yeah. to crawl all the that's way right. down. That's right, that's right. And, uh, you know, the growth of HEMA is just uh, incredible. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, I got into this only a couple of years ago. Uh, and and realized quickly that um, that there was a, a demand for it. That people were looking to to study the arts in a variety of ways. Um, right. We uh, f I had a couple guys who've got a really interesting set of experiences, both uh, uh, in German background, uh, mm -hmm. focused on the longsword right. with uh, with different uh, schools over yeah. the years to come. Mike Capanelli and Nick Murrow are two um, uh, really were sort of the founders of Long Island Historical Fencing Society. Gotcha. So uh, we got together, uh, really haven't done a lot of advertising yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got 15 people, uh, which is just astounding that's, to that's me. That's great. For one year, I believe, roughly. For one, we just passed yeah. our first year. Yeah. Congratulations. Uh, our birthday, we're one. <laughs> so nice. Yep, nice. Send rattles or whatever. Sure, um, sure. And Binkies. It's, it's uh, we learned from a whole bunch of people that, that were close in the HEMA community like yeah. yourselves. We come to these events yeah. uh, looking to pick up best practices. Right. And, uh, and and that's sort of the background, and we're all sort of learning and growing together, and that's why we yeah. call ourselves a society. You know, right, absolutely. Everyone's contributing. Well, it's good to hear that uh, we've got more more things springing up, you know, on the eastern seaboard. So it sounds like the uh, the message, the take home message, should be, you know, if you're in the Long Island area, the New York area, this is one of the good groups to, to check out, right? That's right. It's us. Uh, you know, Mike Edelson certainly has a presence still with NIFA. Uh, and Tristan's giving a class uh, as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. and we, yeah. we actually spoke with Tristan um, uh, today, and we're going to probably do a little home and away. With the, good, our, good. The side's going to meet up yeah. with Tristan in New York, and he's yep. going to bring his group out. And so we'll, you know, uh, that's how our group started as well. So Yeah. Well, you've got a nice hub here, so yeah. um, yep. we, we love coming up to Boston. Awesome. And, you, know, we're, uh, you know, we're willing to travel. So Okay. Great. It was great having you here. And, Thanks so uh, much. We'll, we'll be chatting more. So. All right. Sounds All good. Right. Back to you, Scott. All right, thanks, Brad. All right, so uh, now that we are done with Dagger, um, we are about to talk about a pretty, uh, pretty new event format that um, I like to call our event, uh, among other things, a pretty grand experiment because um, if you think about all the different elements that we have here, uh, we uh, we do a lot of a lot of new things, uh, pilot events, and this is one of them. So yeah, we're going to open up now with the spear competition. This is a, a similar design based off, uh, the spears are based off of a similar design of the collapse of the dagger, these are collapse of the spears. These are prototypes, so we always kind of expect to see some wiggle in the spears. <laughs> yep. um, <clears throat> so these are padded from tip to butt. Yeah, it's a first, uh, first outing. It's Fight. an attempt yep. to m open up another market for and competitive HEMA. And uh, as people can see, it's Axel Pedersen, well known from Sweden, against Dustin Reagan, also very well known from the States, uh, Oklahoma. Oh, and uh, to be clear, it, this is another counted blows format where the counted blow threshold is two this time. They only need two stabs, two successful stabs, uh, to be able to end the round and acquire the point. Right, it looks like I think they gave the point to Axel, or uh, they did not. They I don't no think agreement. no, no agreement on anything there. So they're continuing. Uh, interesting. Ooh, ooh, nice. Ooh, nice. Oh, so nice Harry repost. Yeah. Anything done? No agreement. Looks like. Yeah. No agreement. No agreement once again. Uh, interesting Fight to see ready. spear versus spear uh, when a right-hander is fighting left-hander. That's true. Yeah. Um, who's inside, who's outside? It can yeah. change very quickly. Um, these guys are working with a very wide grip to help accommodate that. Oh! oh. See how the judges so call Axel that. Axel certainly was in deep, but... Yeah. First game. Oh. Point red. Wow, yeah. so they're giving it to Dustin actually. Yeah. Yep, no, I, I would agree ready. with one judge who said that there was a double here. Yeah, but, yeah. So um, there's definitely a connection on yeah, both, we, but 
We're sitting in a similar position to him, right, so of right. course we would agree. Okay. So now Axel being a little bit more careful because he knows this, this can matter quite a bit. He's got to defend himself. Both of these guys really good with distance. See what that means nice in terms push of... push off by Axel there. Yeah. Ooh, oh, nice, oh. nice. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, nice lever action with the yeah, spear. Yeah, try to get that body lock uh, on the rear side. Unfortunately, okay. the equipment probably Blue. helped slow that down. Right. But uh, what's hey, exciting hey, is to move. see that degree of technique. That's Very right. good Fight use of tempo. Nice little Fight. offsets in there by him and uh, set it up. So yeah. there's a lot of potential in these, I think, for yeah. uh, future future tournaments. Yeah. Now, the other thing that's worth pointing out is that um, they are not limited in their grip whatsoever. They can change to one-handed grips or reverse grips or anything, so they are making a conscious choice in terms of the way that they're holding these weapons. But they are not allowed to cut or swing with That's right. That no, right? Yeah, not it must be thrust format. only. Thrust yeah. only with thrust the tip. Only. Ooh, looks like Dustin might have gotten one. Oh, eh? Was that a second? No? Yes. Oh! Yep. Looks like it's being pulled. Yes. And they're giving it to Dustin. Yeah. Good to point see red. that for Dustin. Nice. Nice. Very good. All right, so oh, Dustin is up one point, two to one. Fighters ready. Fight! These guys have faced each other a number of times over the weekend <laughs> uh, with a variety of weapons. They've really become ooh, good ooh. comrades. Oh, right in the oh. face, right in the face, yes. And uh, now, <clears throat> it's important to realize these weapons, even though they're padded head, head to toe in terms one of the, the, the foam, there is mass behind them. So even though they're collapsible, um, you know, if you get hit in the head uh, with a strong enough thrust, that's a lot of mass still, so. Well, that's the danger with any pole arm. Absolutely, yeah. uh, Which is why they... Oh, oh time! At the Let's end see. of the first round, the score is tied 2-2. Two, two. Oh. We go to tiebreaker, sudden death. Axel brings it back. <laughs> yeah, pole arms are very difficult to compete with safely, uh, even to friendly spar ready? with. Uh, the Fighter potential ready. for injury is very Fight. strong, which is why it's generally done in full armor. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, oh, Devoid actually, Dustin under. getting close enough so that the points pass oh. him. Oh. Yeah. Dustin doing a really nice job there. Let's see if his glass has survived. Looks like, all right, so that, that bout goes to Dustin. And as people are resetting the board, uh, we see on the, score, the, the scoreboard here, the visual scoreboard for our viewers, uh, that first dot indicates uh, Dustin has won the first of three bouts. Uh, and again, reminder to the audience that uh, for pretty much all the bouts going forward, it's uh, the best of three, best of three bouts. So, Dustin needs one more. Fight. Axel needs to win two more. Come back. Oh, that's one. That's one from Pedersen. Nice try. Ooh. Oh, oh, nice. Perry and counter thrust by Dustin. One point yeah. right. Ready. Fighters Fight. out there having a discussion amongst themselves about how that should have been judged. Mm -hmm. Very common uh, amongst they are want fighters. to do, yes. Axel trying to work to the outside. Uh, and uh, Dustin, to some degree, inviting it a little bit. Looks like, ooh, it gets to the outside. Does he, oh, does he get enough stabs? Oh, good parry to the side. And now, oh, and yep, nice stabbed to the face fight. by Axel. Just one more, just one more. Can you get it? Oh. Yes, yeah. looks like really he's really interesting away. to see these guys really trying to work, you know, low point line point parries, blue. high line parries, uh, sweeps almost in some cases. Ready. Um, my understanding point. is that these guys have not spent a lot of time with Spear, so the, their ability to adjust is really a testament to their skill sets as, uh, as, as competitors and as athletes, uh, and uh, you know their understanding of how weapons work in general. Ooh, did he get, well now, target is head or torso, so a low strike to the, to the leg is not going to help nice, Dustin. Oh. Nice head dodge by judges. Reagan. Uh, the no judges agreement. do not agree on how that went down. Ready. Fight. 
Yes, yep, yep. Axel left that open. Is he inviting it? Probably, no Axel, but uh, wasn't able to cover it. Oh, ducking, yeah. Changing height on target. Interesting tactic from Patterson. Actually, we're maybe 20 feet away and we can hear the, uh, the labored breathing. One point red. Ready. Ooh, nice wine, nice wind action. Hmm, now is that gonna be awarded to one or, okay. And there's not complete agreement here, actually. One point blue. Okay, so they're giving it to, to Pedersen. Yeah, I think that's the right call. Axel made a nice thrust down yeah. to the, the, yeah. the ribs. Um, there was some back and forth action where I do believe Dustin got a stab in on him, but Axel's second thrust came through uh, on the high line towards the right. chin. Uh, it was pretty solid. So, uh, so just making a couple of mask adjustments for Dustin here? Yeah, Dustin's one of those uh, fencers who have to deal with the additional equipment <laughs> issue of glasses. I know that um, feeling well. So Fighters ready. Fight! Kind of got to give the guy a minute to get it together there. Right, here, right, we here we go. Here we go. Ooh, playing with grips, playing with grips. Oh! Hmm, kind of a messy exchange there. Let's Eight see if there's anything done. And it looks like the judge is not willing to award anything on, on that exchange. Tied 2 2. Tied. Go to sudden death. All right. Now, these guys are not going to be happy about this. Um, while they're, I'm sure they're both happy to be in the game, uh, they have fights later on in the, uh, in the event, I believe. Yeah, All certainly the, Axel. Axel does. Yeah. Oh, Fighters perhaps ready. Dustin is not going to be in the game. Yeah. Fight! Um, so using up all of his energy after a heavy morning and a heavy day yesterday, it's not something he really wants to be doing. He wants right. to get this done and get it over with quick. Uh, and so, but Dustin is, uh, oh, you know, he's making him like work for it. And actually, enough to actually push off perhaps that stab, counter stab from, from Reagan. Yep. So again, the, the mass behind these, stuff, these spears actually can be done. Oh, oh it looks Dungeon. like Dustin may have gotten in. Red. Nice. And Dustin pulls it out. Nice work from both of them. Nice, really nice work. And so with those two wins, we have a victor. And Dustin Reagan, our spear champion. So, do you want to talk a little bit about the the award for best all-around fighter and how that's yeah, going to be absolutely, scored? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, as people have obviously noticed by now, we've got several different uh, tournament formats, um, and one of the reasons for doing this is to encourage participants to broaden the uh, the skill the skill sets that they need to uh, they need to uh, <laughs> practice. Um, uh, uh, and uh, speaking of the, you know broadening those skill sets, one of the things that we do need to do is uh, provide equipment to make sure that people can fight uh, safely. Um, and sparring and gloves actually is one of the vendors uh, that uh, is providing um, prizes for this event. Um, uh, there's actually, as, I, as we said earlier, the, the hand protection for the community has evolved quite a bit uh, over the past few years. And sparring gloves has got to be one of the uh, sort of gold standards at the moment in terms of uh, really good functional uh, safety hand protection uh, for, uh, certainly for longsword and, and really for other weapon forms as well. So, Sure, nearly all of the, the best fighters around the world are working with these gloves. You know, they're based off of a historical design and, you know, they're mitten shaped gauntlets mm -hmm. and using lightweight modern materials uh, in order to allow for more, you know, freedom in terms of playing glove fashion. So here we are moving on to the arming sword events. And I'll be using a similar format here uh, where once again we've got Sean McCoy. He's an out of forte sword play who will be fighting uh, against another forte guy, Matt Iverson. Yep. Sure you're not biased about this fight at all, Jeff? Uh, honestly, I, I'm not sure that I am. I'm not sure who, uh, who I think is going to come out on top here. Both of these guys 
Both of these guys should know better in terms of double blue. hits, Value. which they, they're actually going to give that to, blue. to blue as not a double hit. Interesting. Fighters, Interesting ready. call. Yeah. Fight. All right. So now, now I, I'll say both of these guys tend to, to train longsword, so it is interesting to see them port those skill sets to, uh, to arm and sword or side sword. Uh, and Judges. After this call, you should mention how that we didn't Double have hit. an arming sword tournament per se. We had right. a special tournament, and how we've ended up with a final Fight. for arming sword versus a final for sword and buckler. Do right. you want to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, it's a it's a format that we piloted this year where um, we wanted to start the full field of participants fighting with the same basic weapon uh, to to sort of uh, assess their skill level and and Fight. force them oh. to to qualify to fight at a more complex uh, weapon form. So blue. those are the folks, uh, those folks who actually um, uh, qualified, uh, you know, once they started Ready. with this this nylon or the synthetic uh, one-handed sword, were allowed to then move on to adding a buckler for the second phase or elimination phase and fight from there. Uh, for those who did not pass the qualifier stage, um, the nice thing about the quote elimination stage is that um, uh, it, it really was not a case where they were eliminated, but in fact were allowed to fight on continuing uh, with this same basic weapon. So uh, one of the nice advantages of this format is that even uh, if you did not quote qualify, you were able to get more bouts out of it. Uh, and, uh, and that's an important format. Oh, very nice, very nice. Leg cut with a nice parry of the afterglow afterward. Very good. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting choice. Uh, you know, there are a number of people in the Buffalo community who feel that, you know, if you're not proficient Ready. with a single-handed weapon, Fight. perhaps not be playing with a dual weapons. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Matt's taken an interesting choice here. Matt Iverson's decided to fight left-handed for the uh, for this exchange, at least. Uh, it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see how that um, is playing with Sean McCoy's yeah. game. Does Sean... <laughs> has Sean noticed? Probably. He's probably noticed by now. He seems to be <laughs> hot, hesitating. <laughs> and, uh... Interesting. Now, it's an interesting choice. Yeah, I, I, I believe that uh, Matt's wrist uh, was injured earlier this year and he's still you know he's still rehabbing it a little bit uh, so that may be influencing his choice here oh. Oh. Yep. but uh, still seems to be pretty pretty functional now um, it's also worth After mentioning on the red. screen we do have Value. a skull up there and that's simply to indicate the fact that there is a double hit uh, and again One three double two. hits and it's a double loss so they will be looking not to add any more Ready. to that list and uh, at this point Matt Iverson in my opinion, a very good tactician. So at this point, I kind of suspect he's probably going to take his time. Take his time. He's not in a rush. Yeah, he's up. He's up pretty good. <laughs> the time is out. Yeah, there. there you go. Round one, six three. All right. So at this point, they'll reset the board. Give Matt Iverson the one belt win. One more, and he uh, wins the whole. Uh, championship, um, but uh, Sean gets a chance to, to, to fight back. And as we saw earlier, uh, when Sean was fighting with Dagger, he can he can be surprisingly aggressive when, when he puts his mind to it, which, when you put it with uh, someone who's as aggressive as Matt is, uh, can result in some pretty spectacular fireworks on the, on the floor. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, but I have to say that is the case, um, and it's nice to see them showing respect for that aggression in right, each other, right. perhaps because they know right. each other, Round two. Um, but they weren't just wail walking out there and wow. wailing away. Right, right. Uh, yep. Th yep. They made adjustments right. after those double hits. Yeah, exactly. Fight. All right. Another salute. So here we Another go into round two. All right, Max has gone back to his right-handed grip. Oh, looks like that might have been a double, but... Oh, oh. yeah. What do we say? What do we say? Yeah, I think we agree. Little... Double hit. Double hit. First double. Okay. Fighters ready. Yeah. Fight! So, let's see, uh, let's see if they make adjustments. Try to play with the tempo perhaps a little bit more, distance a little bit more to make sure. Oh. Very good, at least oh. there's a tempo separation. Now, did Sean Judges. actually land an afterblow there? Looks like he, they believe they, he, did, they, he did. One point red, one point blue. Ready. <clears throat> Fight. As we're watching here, it's worth reminding, or really introducing people to the fact, I, I don't believe we've mentioned Manchelino yet, have we? 
No. Um, and uh, if you want to give maybe some background. Yeah, there. a lot of the rule sets here. Uh, Manchulino is a fencing Ooh, master. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, oh, oh. Italian fencing master. <laughs> Judges. Uh, Attempt to run away. <laughs> failed. Tassel on red. Value. Uh, the old turn your back and run trick. Yeah. Doesn't work Not as often quite. as people want it to. Three points blue, one point red. Um, All right. Ready. Yeah, 1532 Manchulino uh, published a treatise. Uh, in it, there are a few lines that uh, we've taken and we can use as sort of bare bones to put together a rule set, uh, which we used uh, earlier this year at Factory America. Uh, a lot of the rules Judges. for some of the tournaments here are based off the similar concepts. Um, and in no fact, there's a it. tournament in Ready. Finland later this year, uh, hosted by uh, Ilka Hardikainen and those guys, um, where they're going to take another variation on the Manchulino rules uh, and run a nice tournament there. So we're excited to see Ooh. that. Ooh. Ooh. Um, Looks like he got deep Judges. enough on the inside. Yeah, nicely done. Ooh. Um, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> another glasses engineering uh, challenge here. Three points blue. Yeah. Looks like he's Sean's fine, just needs to make the adjustment. Yeah, so the point's gonna go to blue, three points. Yeah, I'm very excited to see more and more groups playing with the historical formats since we are, his, well, you know, HEMA groups. Um, and again, and this is not the first time that we've played with this, right? No, 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 no. And, you know, there have been a number of groups who've played with them now. Uh, but this movement, this trend towards looking at the historical formats and trying to get a little closer to understanding what they were doing. Fighters ready. Um, you know, we don't understand all the details. That's right. But we've, we're not going to understand them if we completely ignore them. And so right, gr right. great on all the groups that are moving that way. Um, <clears throat> oh, oh, look at that. Nice. Nice low leg hit. And at now the runaway actually does work. Red, Very good. Value. It is quite appropriate to talk about One Manchelino right now because Manchelino's manuals, Ready. while it does make reference to other weapons, it largely focuses Fight. on single sword and sword mm -hmm. and buckler, sword buckler. Right. which we'll be seeing. Here in a moment. Mm -hmm. Matt has gone back to that left-handed grip. His wrist must be... Oh, oh, oh. And he must feel that, you know, with only 27 seconds left on the clock, he can probably... Uh, Mix it up and uh, take the risk. Yeah, he can take mm -hmm. a little no risk. <clears throat> Ready. He's certainly Fight. not confident in that risk because he's back to the right hand again. <laughs> and oh, Matt, are you just messing with your colleague? Seems to be working. Uh, oh, did he get the yeah. parry? I'm not quite judges. sure. I'll be very surprised if the yeah. judges call it. Yeah, yeah. and That's this right. is after one of the beauty of the structure of this rule set, where the after blow is allowed to weigh as much. It really teaches strategy. Right. And in this case, red. Matt's Matt suffered from this a couple times That's now, the where he took the low so, line, trying to get that low shot to the blue. leg, but opens up By the head in doing so. Three. Allowing the, the, the after blow to come in and actually uh, by getting more points um, teaches people to be more cautious and judicious about making these silly uh, strategic choices like that. Uh, it's a high gamble, uh, possibly high reward, uh, but it's also, you know, you can suffer quite greatly from it as well. So, um, this is one of the subtleties of the historical formats, or at least playing with them, that a lot of people haven't leaned on to yet. But more and more people are, and that's very exciting yep. because as we see an improvement in strategies by fencers, we're going to see improved fencing, uh, and that's going to get us back to the manuals with improved understandings of how to apply the things that we've been right. interpreting right. all these years. Right. Um, so, uh, congratulations to Matt Iverson for winning uh, two out of three of his yeah. rounds. And now uh, over to Natasha to do a little interview with the winner. Okay, we're here with our winner, Matthew Iverson, with Forte Swordplay. Um, so tell us, how long have you been fighting? Uh, a little over a year. Okay. And what is your main focus in your school? Uh, main focus is two-handed sword, mostly German schools. So do you practice one-handed, or did you pick it up this weekend? We do actually practice a little bit one-handed. Actually, ironically, Sean and I are the main proponents of, or the main ones who practice with the one-handed sword. So we are rehearsing our usual Sunday morning fight. Okay. Um, and are you... What manuals are you reading now? Are you looking at the historical texts? Or? No, we're really not. We're really <laughs> just playing around at this point. Well, we'll get there. Okay, well, thank you very much. So, <clears throat> I think we'll be doing a little bit more work in my school about uh, getting people educated on what treatises are out there. 
But uh, I think, you know, it, it brings up an interesting point about, um, you know, what the focus ought to be for beginners. You know, do we focus on the uh, historical material first or do we look at uh, fundamentals? Well, me personally, I love the chaos of HEMA and that there is no rule set or structure for how clubs do this. A lot of clubs like their people, you know, their beginners to get uh, inundated in manuals very early on. I personally take a very different approach and I, I prefer... Um, that a lot of our, our new members don't look at manuals straight away um, so that we can develop them, them some solid basics uh, because I feel that uh, a person with a good you know foundation in footwork and cutting mechanics and you know and a number of other things um, is more uh, intelligent when going to look at the manuals and therefore they're going to come back and then we'll have these discussions as they're more of a veteran fencer and we'll have more intelligent discussions about interpretation rather than me spending a lot of time in the classroom working with, um, you know, answering sort of, you know, entry-level questions. But other clubs take a very different approach. So it really is a club-to-club a, a -club environment. Yeah. Uh, and you got to love that about HEMA. Yeah. And I will say for us, we've taken sort of an evolution from the earlier treatise first. Heading over to the Sword and Buckler finals. All right, getting to the good stuff. <laughs> so two competitors that we, uh, you're not biased at all. Um, two competitors that we have already seen, Axel Pedersen and uh, Andrew Kilgore. Again, let's see, uh, let's see how Andrew's uh, doing now. Axel came out and won a Sword and Buckler tournament in Houston, Festival America, earlier this year. Um, really upset a number of the Buckler fighters over here. Uh, He's not known as being a buckler oh, fighter. Very nice he came exchange. over into the distance. U.S. and you know, put the boots to him. Um, he's got a real possibility of doing it again here. Uh, it's really put the American buckler community on notice. Um, and, uh, he's a very exciting buckler fighter. He uses some different strategies uh, than a lot of the other groups do. Um, nice. Judges. So as we watch here, I, I'm, I'm reminded of some of the behavior I saw from him at Festival America earlier this year, where where he really likes to play, you know, play with the the height difference in terms of his targets. So he'll he'll go high and then cut low, or go low and then cut high. Yeah. Ooh, look at that nice straight attack right to the face. Yeah, he likes Beautiful. to change elevations a lot. Yeah. That got him in trouble in one of the finals of FA, and it's just gotten him in trouble here. Not in this exchange, but once again. Uh, going for that low line leg thrust opens the head, right. and so you may have been the first guy to hit, but you weren't the guy to make the solid hit um, or to the more valuable target. Um, and so you'll, I think you'll probably see an Axel move away from that strategy mm -hmm. now, because right. it usually takes one to remind you that that's not a good right. choice. Right. Right. Now, does his repertoire for buckler techniques or one-handed techniques extend that far? Um, mm -hmm. it certainly does in longsword. There's no question about that. But we're about to see how he cheat pursues this here. Yeah. Uh, the score and is five to three. It can really change leads quickly. No. Oh, no. Nope. Nope. Yep. Looks like the afterglow probably did not land. Let's see. Nope. Yeah, oh, no. actually, yes. Yeah, Andrew's taking a very simplified approach. He's uh, he's kind of you know working the range, and then he's basically raining down uh, you know in parry repost typical buckler parry repulse form he's just raining down cut one after cut one after cut one hoping that his height and perhaps his physical strength will get through on that and, that, and in that case it's a little it predictable <laughs> but works but he didn't get away axle free oh actually they're calling it that axel got the first hit and then axel suffered the afterglow yeah axel only up by one point now axel yep so, got to be careful. Well, this could go either way very, very quickly. It's a shame Axel's not more familiar with some of the 133 pairing positions, the obsessio, um, might be able to help him with those meaty, heavy blows from above. Uh, but we'll see what happens. He's a pretty crafty guy. We'll see how he does here. Andrew does not want to take the advantage. Oh! Judges! Hmm. If there was anything, no it was light, so no agreement. No agreement. What? We'll fight on. We've got four seconds left in this round, and they'll probably stall out. Oh. Oh. Actually, 
Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Oh, actually, hmm. Will there be a safety call? Will there be a safety call? Because Woo! strikes to the back of the head, strikes to the back of the head are illegal. Yeah, this is one of those situations where this is partly the responsibility of the fighter. The fighter ran in, knowing the bell was after, and um, made a you know a couple flailing blows, and then turned his back on the fighter before the action was safe. Before he knew he was safe. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so while it's not great on Axis Park to take that strike to the back of the head, it's also certainly not good fencing to turn your back on an opponent. Right. Absolutely. Um, so we'll see how this plays out. So Axel did pull out that win. Yep, at eight by to six. a margin of just two points, so. We'll see how he adjusts here. Uh, does he adjust his strategy? Um, <clears throat> hmm. It'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, giving them a little bit of a break to uh, adjust various things. So at this point, if you were uh, Andrew Kilgore, what might you be thinking in terms of strategy? Well. <laughs> um, do you mean in terms of my own performance or in terms of how to defeat Axel? Either. I mean, I, I suppose put yourself in Andrew's shoes with that kind of a performance, what would you change? Well, I would give up so much on the, you know, simple attacks of, you know, right. cut one, cut one, cut one. Yeah. Um, it's kind of hard to say that, though, because he's actually getting through from time to time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he's getting through at the high point, you know, at the, the, the high value points. Right. So, you know, but it's it's not going to work against a veteran like Axel. Right. right? I mean, yeah, not I'll be very surprised anyway. if yeah. it does. Right. Right. Um, so, any other tools you would? But he's think also going to run into the issue that a lot of fighters run into. Uh, we've seen this in other sports, yeah. and it's going to happen in, in in HEMA, where it's all well and good to win, uh, but people are going to want exciting wins. They're going to want demonstration of skills. They're not going to want. You know the same two techniques seen over and over in the finals of every tournament around the world. They're going to want to start seeing men show off their skills, which is what tournaments really got their impetus from in the first place. You know, uh, we wanted to work on techniques and find uh, an, a, a competitive environment for demonstrating performance based out of the manuals. Right. Um, and if you're only using two techniques out of the manuals, um, the guys who start bringing a wider repertoire to the table are really going to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. So Andrew should. You know, might want to consider that a, a wider repertoire might go far, yeah. especially with his attributes. I mean, he's a very right, tall right. guy, very mm -hmm. fit, very athletic. Certainly likes to compete. Um, mm -hmm. He's got a lot of potential to be an exciting fighter. Yeah. Let's see. What, let's see what he does. Uh, trying a couple of uh, cutting things. Ooh, oh! actually, that might have been a strike on P Pedersen first. Red. Yes. Yeah. yeah. One point red. So. Axel, I think, hit ready. hit under the uh, left arm from below to the to the flank, and uh, not clear if he managed to get the after blow, but he's not being awarded it. So now he's got to come from behind a little bit. Yes, looks like he got it. Looks like he got it. Yeah, it looks like Axel's going to take that point. I'll be very surprised if there's anything else. Yep. Yep. One point blue. One point blue. So we're back and to we're the tie. Again. Ready. <laughs> oh! Now that'll be interesting to see how the judges call yes. that. There's a clear thrust, but Axel also after made a very solid Value. after blow yeah, cut to the head. Oh. And the judges got yep. this one Three right. Excellent Three job by Excellent. The very good job, yes. Exactly. So the score remains tied. Ready. Um, but we are that much closer to uh, yeah, ending the bout. Too. And this is another thing that, uh, you know, not just these fighters, but all fighters need to think about is. You know, while these rule sets, uh, rule sets similar to this, weighted scoring, um, oh! do uh, allow for scoring with the afterblow, um, a lot of human needs to really blue. get conscious to the idea that afterblows are not good fencing. Right. 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 Double One hits are not red. good fencing. Afterblows are not good fencing. Um, they're marginally better than the, uh, double hits in the sense that they. Oh, look at that! Oh. It again, does work. You know, they identify Judges. a good use of tempo. But uh, blue, we can't value. get into this mindset that after blow is good. One point right. blue. So right. when you've got a fight Ready. like this where Fight. exchange after exchange after exchange after exchange uh, is finishing in, in an after blow, uh, we can't really get excited about the fencing as dramatic oh. as it may be. Oh. <clears throat> Not in terms of reaching Judging. high levels of skill. 
Uh, and in fact, I was speaking with Matt Easton from Scala Gladiatoria earlier this year about that uh, when I was over there at Fight Camp. Mm-hmm. And, um, in the UK, right? Yeah, right. Correct. Mm-hmm. And we were discussing that much as we've done in the number of tournaments where, you know, three doubles and you're out, um, the possibility of including after blows in that, you know, three doubles or after blows and or. Oh, oh man. Uh, maybe, you know, for a year to open it up to five. Five doubles or after blows and it's a double oh, out. Oh, 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 actually. Oh, what do we Did they give the foot? The blue. foot can will be Ready. counted as as two points if someone Fight. strikes it. So no, there was they, only they one call. Though. Yeah. I think that's yeah. the right. I call. think it, I think so as well. That um, foot is hard to hit. So, which probably is the point. Yeah, yeah. When the debate over the foot versus lower shin is an interesting one in the human community. Oh. oh. Yeah. Axel's found Andrew's rhythm now. He's found yeah. his tempo. Yeah. And he's, he's not going to go Value. in for the deep shots and trade blows with him. He's going to conserve his energy. One point blue. Take the easy he's way. He's going to take the, the, the slow uh, way. Uh, halt. That's, That's right. That's and match. he wins on points at nine points. Yeah. All right. By a score of nine to five. He's round. won both of uh, the first two fights, so he'll win this tournament. He'll win yet a second Buckler tournament in the United States. And he'll go wow. on to fight in the long Longford Steel Finals. Anyway, well, we make an adjustment. Getting back to finish off that point um, that Matt Easton and I were talking about with this this notion of limiting the number of doubles and limiting the number of afterblows might be a direction for uh, some tournaments to go mm, in order to yeah. really move the ball further down the field towards demanding and expecting clean, good, clean intelligent or, fencing, yeah, sensible absolutely. fencing that is cautious and not just you know cavalier and, and, and brazen. So, so as we are uh, <coughs> switching over to the next event, um, we are going to be doing an interview very brief, uh, uh, just right now with uh, Natasha and Axel, uh, and, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about our sponsors. Okay, we're here with our winner, Axel Peterson. Um, so this is the second Sword and Buckler tournament yeah. you've won. Have you been practicing Sword and Buckler? Uh, a little bit, yes. A little bit more since last time. Uh, but. Um, I've been lucky to, to train a little bit with uh, Thomas Nyliken of Fria Lister in Norway. He's mm. a, a very skilled buckler fencer and uh, I've done a little bit more in my home club as well in Sweden. So, so you're, you're getting others in your club to do this also? Uh, not yet, <laughs> but there are many clubs in Sweden. Luckily we are very good friends, all of us, so we train together. Good. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well. Yeah, you heard uh, Axel mentions Thomas uh, near looking um, out of the food there in, in Norway. Uh, I was up there last year. Fantastic club. Uh, the, he's, he's absolutely right. That's a great trainer, and they, they've got a number of great buckler fighters up there. And in fact, Thomas was the coach for um, oh, darn it, uh, Miss Christine Consmo, who was the first oh. female to win uh, any of the um, open tournaments uh, in the Hemis Pacific community. It's very cool. Um, and I'm sorry, when you say open, you mean... What do you mean? Uh, you said open tournament. Well, open, yeah, not me, not, me, uh, not segregated. Right. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we're on to the next time. All right, well... Moving on to open longsword finals with uh, what we were considering the basic weapon, the starting weapon that all competitors of fighting longsword were asked to use, which is the synthetic nylon longsword. And here we go. We've got uh, Don Kinsfader versus from Peter Con- from Forte Swordplay. Right. You're correct. Peter Concanon from uh, Sword Class New York City. So one, I believe this is uh, yeah his first tournament, actually. So that's a pretty good showing for Peter making it all the way to the finals here. Yeah, what's interesting about using the swift pairings in the way that the that you have at this event, uh, where everybody's starting off with nylon, and then as you progress, showing that you're skillful, oh. uh, moving on oh, to steel. No. Oh, oh, nice try, Don, nice try. Oh, that's going to have bad. happened out of bounds. Yeah. Probably not going to fly. Oh. Well, they're going to call it. They're going to give it. it. Um, what's interesting about that format is what it's essentially done uh, has allowed us to showcase some beginners mm-hmm. as they get right. through well, well along and do well in the, uh, the nylon, right. even after they kind of got moved out of the seal brackets. Right. Um, so we get, uh, it's allowed us to show some beginners and showcase some more veteran fencers. Um, which, you know, is... Oh, oh, did he get it? Did he get it? 
I, I think judges. Don got through on that, but we'll see how the judges call double, it. Double, double, and nothing. No agreement. <laughs> no That's frustrating. Don's got to be frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so anyway, showcasing beginners versus uh, advanced fencers is not, you know, certainly not trying to create leagues or divisions, but it's an interesting sort of organic way to do that a, uh, on a single tournament level. Uh oh, oh. Don's get am I get in trouble with his height? Oh, oh there he is. yeah. yeah. <coughs> Good try to make adjustments there, but uh, wasn't able to. Yeah, he pull that out. Sort of hesitated between decisions. Should I go for yeah, the right. half sword? Right, right. It uh, was a, it was a good thought process, but just a little too slow. Yeah. Getting a little bit of coaching yeah. from Matt Iverson, our uh, arming sword champion. Let's see if that helps. Now, <clears throat> I will tell you, having uh, fenced with uh, against Don Kinsvater right. quite a bit, uh, Don is quite quite long in his Value. reach. He's um, a very tall guy. Yes, he is. Yes, and actually, I mean, red. he's not the tallest, but his reach, his his uh, his geometrical reach, is is just uh, it can really surprise you. So, so we'll see if he actually makes use of it. Right is ready. Yeah, he's right. a very lean, and long, and lean guy. Right. So, yeah. All right, so Peter, sticking with it. Pretty oh, solid. Yeah. Oh, got a little Judges. messy there at the end, but sticking with the pretty standard. Into blue, excellent. Good job from blue. from Don. Yeah. Oh, headshot, headshot, excellent, excellent. Ready. And uh, fight. Just like that, the match is uh, very close once again. Yep, now Peter's up. Oh, did he get that thrust to the face? Not quite. Well, it sure but, seemed uh, like it from here, but I guess the judges didn't agree. So, Don's yeah. going to be a little more cautious now. Oh, actually, I saw oh, contact oh. on the head, but it's it probably not yeah, That's a little bit of a rookie uh, maneuver on Don's part. He was he did get a hit, I would agree with yeah. him on that, and, and he red. thought he got a hit. Value. But he sort of halted there in the middle of yeah. it. Yeah. Three points red. Um, All right, and that hesitation and is going to cost him yeah, three points. He, you have to wait Ready. for the judges' call there, and that, that would cost him there. It's a yeah, shame because that was right. a really well timed thrust on his part, or cut, excuse me. Um, All right. Okay. So he's got to set something else up now. And uh, Peter Kincan. Oh. oh! Judges! The judges, for some no reason, agreement. are not seeing Don's face. Ready! Fight! Well, that happens. You gotta really tidy up that fencing and make it clean. Right, make right. It clean. and visible. Yep. It's part of the art of tournament fighting. You just have to see what you're doing. Don's doing some great parries and knocks. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah, he's, he's yeah. really doing good. Uh, All right. Score, seven to three. Scores. Round one goes to red. All right, so congratulations, Peter Contanen. Uh, we'll see how he does in the second round. During the little uh, break we have here, worth mentioning a couple of our sponsors. You saw the uh, the logo for Sphingus earlier, uh, representing women worldwide for HEMA. Uh, great demographic, obviously, uh, and uh, you know, something that we really encourage in this uh, this this uh, event, uh, trying to get uh, more uh, more women actually involved. Um, so that's something that certainly needs to be encouraged in the community. Uh, also, from across the way uh, in England, I believe, is where they're based, the Hema Shop, uh, part of the Night Shop International. Um, again, they are uh, sponsoring our event and providing some prizes. Um, uh, do you have any uh, experience with them? Oh, I have a ton of experience with them. They're a great ready, bunch ready. of guys, and they've really worked ready. hard to the service that's community. Ready, ready, uh, ready. Uh, they've they've had a larger... Uh, influence and impact on Europe because obviously it's easier for them to reach there but they've been selling swords to the US forever and they're now branching off into a number of other products um, some of which were showcased earlier at fight camp this year and I'm sure will be continued to doled out as the time goes by. Oh. 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 Was that a double or was that yes a double? Okay. Yeah, really good guys double. and, and we're double. fortunate because they're you know the you know Ready. the owner of the company and the, and, and the number fight. of the guys involved on the, on the inside um, they're very passionate about HEMA, and so they look oh, at oh, oh, did he? Uh, uh, oh, how did that go down? That was a distance game that Don just played. Uh, actually, honestly, I think uh, Peter just kind of walked into it. 
Really? Ready. Oh, that's a pity. That's a pity. Fight. It's a clip to the to the left elbow of Peter from Cannon, but uh, I think people didn't pick, catch up on it, pick up on it from the the far side. So can Don can sucker into that again and not get hit by the F blow. Oh, oh, looks like he probably failed Judge on it. pairing the afterblow there. Yeah, red. that's an interesting call. Oh, yeah. Three points, Red. Ready. Fight. And once again, Don is in the hole, having to dig himself out from a head hit. Three point head hit. Mm. Oh, oh, probably a double, but we'll see how they call Judge it. it. Okay, so they're gonna give it in favor of red. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Three points, red. Ready. Right. Fight. And uh, Dong in pretty, pretty deep trouble at this point. Let's see, what, let's see if he can make the last little bit look He's good. He's got a minute. Uh, he can pull this. Oh, that's right. Oh. Well, uh, hopefully, at least an afterblow. Judges. Though. Let's see. Good. So they're giving an afterblow ward. Afterblow. And actually, red. is it on the Value. head? Hmm, okay, all right. One point red, one point blue. Ready. So Peter inches Fight. that much closer to the win. Two points away. Oh, there you go. Oh, really? Oh! Okay, okay, good. Thank you. Judges! Very good. Blue! So. Value! <clears throat> So Peter being, you know, a little bit new to the competitive Ready. game, uh, I think still needs to work a little bit on his distance, or at least enough that uh, someone like Don cannot take advantage of because Don is pretty good at that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's, he's done great. He's done well to get this far. Oh, oh. Ah, right back at Don, though. But, you know, he started off Red. in the same tournament as Axel Peterson and Anton Kaludovic, right. Grit and Nathan Grippers. Mm -hmm. That's why he's fighting in the nylons. He doesn't have a wide variety of techniques. Uh, so he's done well enough to get sort of, you know, through on the beginner. Mm -hmm. yep. But he's not going to be able to pull those sort of strategies and, get, and be very successful against right. more veteran right. fencers. That's right. That's right. So, so now what will be interesting, once we uh, congratulate the winners here, is to compare the level of fencing that you just saw uh, for this so-called basic division uh, with the advanced division for longsword, where uh, people will be using steel. People using steel uh, and uh, uh, also Can run on for a long time, run on for a long time, run on for a long time. Sooner or later, gotta cut you down. You can run on. Slovakian friends, of which uh, one of the, one of them is, is here, uh, Anton Kohutovich, I believe is his name. Yeah, I'm not sure. I thought it was pronounced Kohutovich, but uh, I don't speak Slovakian, so um, he's uh, had an interesting weekend. This is his first time for the United States. Uh, first time competing in a format like this. 
struggled that hard. He's uh, fourth, and he's fighting against, once again, Ben Strickland out of the Triangle Sword Guild, who uh, I really got to say that Ben is one of my most uh, anticipated fencers to watch over the next few years coming out of the United States. Him and his crew, Casper Anderson, um, uh, I've known them for a few years, and I've been impressed with them for a long time, and I think we're going to see more and more good stuff out of them as time goes by. Uh, so it'll be ex interesting to see how he deals with Anton's explosive uh, Forschlag out of this. That's right. Um, if he's got a plan uh, and if he can put it together. So now we're going to do a little different format uh, in this round, I understand, Jeff. Is that correct? Um, simply for, for time purposes, rather than doing best of three, we're going to be doing just a single, single bout. So uh, it's going to be whoever gets to nine points. Uh, otherwise, still basically the same. Uh, nine points hey, or when time runs out. When time runs out, which I believe is a two-minute right. timer. Two-minute timer. Fighters ready. All right. Ben's so. in blue. Fight. Anton's in red. Here we go. So every second counts that much more since it's a single bow. Right. You can watch Anton's footwork very distinctive. Ooh, Fort does he get it? Oh! Judges! Oh, interesting. Disagreement. No agreement. No agreement on Ready. That. Needs to be careful here. Anton really likes to settle into that range, find his inch, and then go. Launch. And he, oh, uh, and he oh. got it with Just. no no answer from Strickline. Judges. Yeah. Bare touch, bare touch, and actually, are they going to give it? No There's agreement. not agreement. There's not agreement. That's okay. Ready. Yeah. Yeah. The ever exciting one handed blow to the leg <laughs> has been done. So we'll see if we can get some more out of that That's right here. Let's see. Let's see what else he's got. Point. Oh! All right. Go. Anton coming in. Coming across to cross. Anything happen? Strike to the head. No oh, agreement. No agreement. One. All right. Interesting call. No agreement. We've got two red batons Ready. and two blue batons up, but not in the same formation. So. so this, as you guys, as, as the folks can see at home, this is uh, this is pretty fast for your stuff. So don't envy the judges trying to catch this this action. Just changing Bats. the game, changing yeah, the game, giving an opening. Out of box. Nice, good. Him. Oh, oh. 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 Well, it's probably Judges. a double, but let's see. Yeah, being considered a double. First double. Ready. Hi. And you've got this much explosive power on both sides. It's, uh, it makes tempo management down. Oh, oh, Ooh, looks like a blow and after blow, perhaps. That's how I see all that. Yep, blow from red and after, after blow from red. Value. Okay. Three points red, one point blue. All right, so that puts uh, Anton Ready. Ahead. Three to one. Fight! One minute left. Let's see what Ben's got. Let's see if Ben will go back to that ox guard. I think he had a yeah, lot of potential something. for success there as long as he can keep the low lines closed. Point! Uh, oh! That was a Judges. double and after blow. Double. Uh, oh, no, actually. After blow on blue, value. <laughs> Judge thinking about it. Three points red, one point blue. Oui. Oui. Ready. Fight. All right, Ben really got to have, have to work now. And be careful. Oh, oh. Yes, I think uh, that's probably Judges. one point gain. Yes, one point gain for blue. Blue, value. That's right. One point blue. Okay, good. Ready, fight! Ben needs more of those. He's got 50 seconds. He's only three points away. That could make the difference. That approach. Oh! oh. See Judges! How... Interesting to see what happens here. So blue. they're giving it to blue. Value. And they're giving him the headshot. Yeah. Technically, that was a shot to the back of the head. Ready. But once again, Anton got spun Fight. around right. Right. Um, right. and didn't try to maintain. So now it's center. evil. We are tied. We are tied, tied at 6-6. Six, six. Anton's probably unhappy about that. Oh, 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 oh. American came back. Judges. After blow on blue, value. Oh. Okay, all right, interesting. Three points red, 
One point blue. Oh, and. Round. My score is Oh, and Anton wins on points. Red. That's right. Well, that. way to use that afterwards. Ben was coming back there. That was a that was a good fight. Well played by both guys. Yep. Tried to yep. mix up uh, and yep. uh, and uh, Ben did a good job of coming back. So yep. hey yep. nothing to be ashamed of. Nothing to be ashamed of in that one. Very good performance by Ben. Perhaps a little and bit of discipline from Ben, to, but yeah. Yep, and congratulations to Anton. That's right. Congratulations to Slovakia. Well represented this time at IGS. So that is our third and fourth, fourth place bout. And uh, so now it's time for <laughs> time to talk about Spess. <laughs> Spess. Actually, we need to say a lot of things about Spess because, um, uh, again, uh, it's it's sort of geographically interesting to talk about them. They are, I believe, based uh, in an area similar to where Eastern Europe, basically. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, they, they come about from, from practitioners. I think uh, practitioners are the ones who have informed a lot of their product design and decisions, and you can really see it reflected in their gear and their equipment. Uh, it's, it's, you know, speaking personally, I think it's some of my favorite gear to wear and to, to use. It's very well designed. Uh, and uh, along those lines, they were invited to, to provide a lot of the prizes for IGX this year. And uh, I think the, the participants going home with these prizes should be pretty happy uh, with the kind of quality that they can expect. Yeah, fantastic product. by a bunch of fantastic stories. Uh, we're really passionate about it. We really just want to help the community and get this stuff out of it. And we really have to thank them for this, Absolutely. this, this and a lot of tournaments. So, here we go, the Here main event. This is uh, in the, looks like it will be the red corner. <laughs> in, the, in the red corner will be Nathan Graparis fighting Axel Pedersen uh, in the blue corner. Now, I think we've heard plenty from about Axel so far. So, do you have any comments about Nathan? I believe you may know him a little bit. I do. I uh, trained Nathan for a number of years uh, until I left Houston, and now he's uh, studying under DeKalb Doe. Um, and amongst traveling around and defending. He's fought in a couple of comp uh, a number of competitions around the world. And uh, <clears throat> what he's done very well for himself. He's represented himself. He's not the tallest fencer, and that's a real accomplishment to, to be so pro uh, proficient in that right, context. Right. So effective, yes. Um, yeah. What a lot of people may not know is that Axel and... Uh, Nathan just fought and Axel beat Nathan uh, last weekend at a tournament in the Netherlands. So, so let's see. Nathan Nathan's is definitely looking itching. to take that yeah. back and not let Axel have him here. Nice. Good distance from Nathan. Oh, nice after blow. Oh, we'll nice after blow. The, we'll see if the judges saw how that went down. Right. From my perspective, was that was it a hit the to the head? arm, yeah. followed by an after blow to the head. And they do not, not recognize that as a hit to the head. That's a real shame for Axel. That happens. Ready. Fight. All right. So we're still even. Still even. Right. No advantage either way. Axel's really changed, or excuse me, Nathan's really changed up his game from the way they fought last time, which is just about the best thing you can do uh, when you're going against a fencer that you just lost to. Don't show him the same game. Oh, oh, oh. Get him, get him, get him. Oh, oh boy. Ah, nice, nice, nice. <laughs> Axel Pedersen kicking up a little bit of dirt there. Value. One point red, one point blue. Oh my goodness! Wow. That was an interesting wow. exchange and an interesting call by the judges. Huh? And there you go. He's he's definitely in the game. It's two two. He's put Axel. Axel's gonna have to change his strategy now, and you can see him hesitating. Whoa! Nice, nice, nice. So, and it's certainly an afterglow situation is, yeah, so probably, again, oh, actually, no agreement, so. No. All right, so, uh, fine. Fair so enough. Effectively, nothing Fight. done. Not the cleanest of exchanges, anyway. <clears throat> Oh, beautiful, beautiful exchange. I'm not sure anything actually happened there. Well, oh. Nathan got hit on the hand. Oh, I see. 
What? Wow. Headshot. Interesting. I'm definitely not clear from our angle, but these things certainly can look different from different angles. So. Well, let's see how he does. Let's see Don't, if he maintains his composure and keeps up that intensity. He'll put Axel in a sticky situation. Axel's not walking over him, that's for sure. Oh, good. Good tempo and distance management. One of Axel's favorite blue. techniques. He'll take the parry on Value. the high line and then the opening tempo, take the low line and parry high on the high line again. Nathan's Ready. still shaking his hand after Fight. that last hit. He may have suffered a broken finger. Hard to say at this point. Um, but that can definitely shake a man's confidence. So we'll see how it plays. Oh! oh. Clean hit to blue. Just one point. One point blue. Ready. Fight. All right, Axel's relaxing a little bit. He's got the advantage he wanted. Oh, oh no! Oh. oh no! Yes. Good Ready. chasing. Yep. Good chasing Boom. by Pedersen. Nathan lost his footing there a little bit yeah. and suffered for it. So we're yeah. at to. Uh, yeah. One point blue. Judge, uh, ref doing a good job of just checking safety in that case. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, an exhausted grunt from Ready. repairs there who felt that he had the headshot in there. Fight! Point. Oh! Judges! No agreement. from the judges there. Axel sitting on match point if he can get a clean hit here. Or any hit at this point. point. Oh. Oh. Well, except the double. Judges. <laughs> yep. Oh, no? Interesting. No so agreement. The judges do not no agreement. identify that as so a double. Ready. Lucky for... Uh, Fight. Lucky for both of them. Oh. So Axel went on time. And points at the time. Two. Blue. So Nathan's shaking his hand a little bit, but it looks uh, looks like it's not an issue, hopefully. Well, his adrenaline's certainly dumped at this point. It's true. He's trying to stay focused on the fight. Yeah. So yeah. we'll have a look at it. Oh, interesting sponsor, Acta Periodica Duella Torm. Fantastic publication that came out uh, earlier this year. Just this year, right. Yeah. Uh, it's put together by a conglomeration of... Um, uh, you know, academics and fencers, and, and you know, some professional, some amateur. And uh, um, <clears throat> what it is, is it's a similar to a previous publication for the HEMA community where there will be a series of articles, some academic, uh, some practical based, and, um, uh, and some research based. Uh, the, the spectrum of them will, will move over time, I'm sure but uh, maybe translations in the future. And there are a number of new people getting involved in the, um, in the publication that are gonna create uh, an even wider, more dynamic thing. I highly recommend getting a copy. It's only available for one place in the United States, and that's through uh, Purple Heart Armory. Uh, but it's a very important publication. Uh, and these are the types of publications that HEMA really needs in order to uh, continue uh, promoting the research side and continue promoting the information side. Um, so get involved with that. Okay, Axel is up one bow, uh, one match to zero to Nathan. Uh, they've had their little break. Uh, they've had a little coaching. Uh, Nathan's had a little coaching from Ben Jarrett over there. I'll see what he's got in mind. Uh, and Table ready. Uh, we can judges move ready. the judges ready, around, ready. For hopefully for Fighters different ready. perspective. And here we go in round two. Oh, oh, interesting, interesting. Oh. Interesting how that'll be called. Yeah. Uh, Nathan's sword got knocked down, uh, tipped down, uh, and got caught on his, uh, on his knee guard. Value. Allowing a tempo, a tempo for Nathan to get a hit, but for Axel to make a hit, excuse me, 
Uh, luckily, it looks like Nathan was able to come back with an afterglow before things fell apart. Um, and so it just goes to show you the, the importance of structure with these defenses. Uh, if you can break through those, that can really cost you. And it shows you also how much how much power has been thrown. Yeah, well, Axel slid up the blade similar sort of a manner to a, a small sort of uh, Gizar, um, obviously on a different context, but uh, that really put a lot of pressure on him, on Nathan's uh, structure, as you say. Yeah. Oh! oh, nice cover, nice cover. Judges! So, so Nathan, Once again, Nathan Value. sticking with the tried and true method of always One coming back two. with an afterglow on a descending Ready. cut, uh, which veteran right. fencer like Axel's not going to fall for. They expect that, so they cover the high line, um, and that's put a, a, Axel up two to one. And Axel also employing a lot of flurry activity, lots of incoming cuts, safe cuts where he's covered, but uh, really putting pressure on Nathan to respond. Oh. Ooh, probably an uh, sorry, Judges. probably a double. Oh. No agreement. No agreement. No agreement. No agreement. Ready. Fight. Oh, oh. Hmm, interesting. We'll see how the judges call that. They're going to. They're not going to agree. No agreement. Um, interesting Ready. call. Fight. Ooh. Oh! Yeah. Nathan got judges. three. We'll see if the judges yes. think he got three to the head or red. if they got him on the head. Value. They're giving him no, the head. They gave him nice. the head shot. So Nathan's red. up for the first right. time Ready. in this battle. This is his opportunity. His so, opportunity to keep that, keep that advantage. Axel will probably come out fairly aggressive here. Oh! And that's exactly what he judges. did. Tried to push Nathan out of the guard. <laughs> Blue! Axel Value. does not like to be behind. Yeah. Well, three points blue. Who does? Think, really? I don't think many people do. Ready. Fight. So Axel got three points. He's now in head again. Let's see if Nathan can keep his momentum going. Oh! oh. oh. Pairing with the forearm is probably not going to solve Judges. what he wants. Smooth. Value. One point blue. So one point for blue, where the score is six, six to four. four. Uh, while Axel Patterson uh, tidies up some equipment issues out of that last exchange. Perhaps buying himself a little bit of breathing room here. Well, I certainly hope Axel isn't the type of fellow to buy himself a little room to catch his breath. <laughs> think. Uh, and I'm joking about that, of course. Axel. Fight is ready. Axel's a supreme Fight. gentleman co competitor. Okay. So Nathan has to win this battle in order to go to the Nice one. parry from oh! Nathan. Nice parry from Nathan. Yeah, judges! He did get an afterglow to the head and yeah. a nice schnitt. He demonstrated the schnitt. We'll see if the judges can catch it. Afterglow blue. Value. Okay. All right. Interesting. So Interesting. It's so it's one point blue, three points red. One point blue, three points red. <laughs> Ready. Tied at seven all. Fight. This is a heck of about two points away from the win either way. Axel <laughs> chose a different strategy for that yes, one. Yes, yes. Well. Blue. I, I believe Value. is the technical term the direct approach. Bring out, <laughs> bring out, bring out is one. One blue. All right. So Ready. halfway there <laughs> does get back in the lead. Fight. Uh, with the <laughs> buffalo approach. Seven, <laughs> six, five, four. Yeah, oh, 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 connected with the head. Was that? See how judges. Judges. see that. There's a lot of action in that exchange. No agreement. <laughs> Ouch. No agreement. No agreement. So this will be, this Ready. is always the dangerous play Here's when the fighters know they Ma only have one. Hail Mary. They've got to come out and go, Hail Mary. Oh! 
And that's a hard it's way to bad. lose a round. That's too bad. So close, so close. Congratulations to Axel Pedersen winning yet another tournament. Probably the most decorated sensor uh, in HEMA today. Really, truly a master of his own craft. And, and another masterful demonstration by him. You know, congratulations to Axel and of course GHFS by Proxy. Um, well done, guys. And good job on Nathan to Paris for putting up a good fight, changing the game a little bit, and making it an exciting match. So, okay, attention everyone. If I could have all the winners come into the ring, please. So, uh, uh, we're going to have a short interview with Axel here. Well, actually, uh, before we do any of that, um, we are getting towards the end of our program, and we'd like to make a couple of comments about media. Uh, media, media in HEMA. Uh, as uh, HEMA is experiencing this, this sort of explosive growth, uh, the importance of media is becoming that much more... Uh, prominent uh, for us. So things like this live stream uh, are critical to letting people know what we're about. And similarly, um, uh, bloggers like Hema News are, are critical also to getting the word out about uh, you know, who's who and what's what in Hema. So run by... Uh, a okay, now if you can return to your seats, we're going to give out the awards. Um, for technical, the, the Technical Excellence Awards. Technical Excellence Awards. Okay, so Jeff is gonna step away from the table for a moment. Uh, what they've done this weekend is they, um, during the rounds after each bout, uh, the judges have been polled to give, uh, you know, a point uh, for either one or both fighters to acknowledge, you know, a good technical display. Um, this is another attempt, as you're seeing more frequently in HEMA events, um, aimed at getting fencers to think beyond just running in, wailing, uh, and trying to actually show a variety of technique. Um, it's still in its early phases in terms of how the judges and the uh, event organizers are managing it and defining it, um, but the spirit of it is there, and they included that here at this tournament this weekend. And <clears throat> So, uh, what we're getting ready to see is Jeff Sai introduce the technical award fencers. And uh, so, we are reaching the end of our program here. And uh, first, first, I want to I want to thank all the competitors for coming uh, to IGX 2013. Um, I hope you guys had a good time. Bigger and badder every year, and hopefully we'll continue that trend next year. Um, now, <clears throat> so uh, the audience and all of you have gotten a chance to see uh, some amazing uh, uh, displays of skill uh, in terms of the, the finalists for these different competitions. Um, over the course of the competition, we have also asked judges to rate people in terms of not just their performance, but in terms of what they saw in terms of technical skill. So after each bout, we, we asked judges to basically rate people on whether or not they saw good technical performances, and we've tallied those, those, uh, uh, the, those points up. So uh, in addition to winning these particular tournament formats, we are uh, awarding technical excellence to each weapon, uh, each, each combat format, each tournament format. And so we're gonna start with uh, the, uh, the lightweight for wrestling. Uh, and that technical award, uh, happy to give it to Casper Anderson from Triangle Short Gill. Nice job, nice job. And uh, in addition, of course, to the medal, uh, a time-honored tradition of laurels. <laughs> laurels for the victors. Actually, stay, stay up here, stay up here. So, uh, so uh, then for, for the heavyweight division, Ben Jerisho from Maryland KDF. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> that wasn't suspicious at all. Okay. So, now for the uh, dagger tournament for the lightweight division. Once again, Casper Anderson, Triangle Sword Guild. <laughs> well done, well done. So, now from. Uh, okay, four. Uh, moving on to the Spear Tournament. Uh, I would love to award that if I knew who it was. And that would be one of my favorite colleagues from Vermont, Charles Murdoch. Yeah. Meyer Freifechter Guild. Yeah. Nicely done, nicely yeah. done. Oh, there we go, there we go. Now Casper feels bad. <laughs> All right. Now, okay, so, moving on now to Spear, perhaps the most uh, <coughs> fun weapon of the, uh, the event. Spear. The wobbly spear, yes. All right, once again, I'm proud to award the Technical Excellence Award to Ben Jericho, Maryland KDF. <laughs> All right, all right. Moving on. Arming sword. One-handed arming sword. Happy to give it to my colleague, Stephen Hirsch, Athena School of Arms. <laughs> well done, well done, well done. Very good. All right. And uh, moving on to Sword and Buckler, the great Axel Pedersen from Gotham, Gothenburg Historical Fencing School. <laughs> nicely done, nicely done. <laughs> All right, uh, two more, two more. So, once again, very well deserved for the nylon longsword. Andrew Kilgore, Athena School of Arms. <laughs> good job, good job. And without much further ado, one of my favorite technical fighters ever from Redlands Fencing Center, Mr. Dustin Reagan. So, in terms of our program, yes, I, okay, so, um, so we're going to give the award for the, the uh, best all-round fighter, okay, uh, that would be the Baron, the Baron uh, from, uh, excuse, oh, sorry, okay, so, Yep, the juror, and I'm not sure where the Baron is, actually. Oh, it's bringing brought? Okay. Ah, here we go. Big party box. Here's the envelope. So, um, <clears throat> this is our lovely prize from uh, Albion Swords that we are awarding uh, to who we are calling the, uh, uh, let's see, I believe the the best all-round fighter. Um, so over the course of all of these tournaments, uh, for those that actually participated in four or more, 
what we did was to tally up the points across uh, all the different comp the competitions and take the top four, uh, the top four scores and add them up uh, and, uh, and look across all the different competitors. And I am very happy to announce that our winner for, for most uh, best all-round fighter uh, is Andrew Kilgore. I will refrain from shaking your hand, <laughs> since that is a very, very sharp sword. Uh, and uh, I believe, okay, so um, I want to give a very special thank you, certainly to everyone who, who came today, uh, but also to, in particular, to the team that, make this, that made this possible, my own Forte Productions team over here. who pulled so many irons out of fires that I can't even, I put, put so many fires out that I can't even count. Um, uh, we are all about to retire to a very well-deserved dinner where we will talk and enjoy ourselves much, muchly. So um, the, the, the last thing I'd like to say is, uh, you know, if you liked what you, see, you saw, then, uh, you know, please come next year when we do this again. And uh, uh, signing off from IGX 2013, uh, we'll see you next year. Yeah!